uh, for Thursday, June 11th, 2020. And with that, uh, can I have a roll call, please? Yes, you may. Uh, Commissioner Barbos. Present. Commissioner Kelso Barnett. Here. Commissioner Lair Barnett. Here. Commissioner Bohar. Not here yet. Commissioner O'Neill. Here. Commissioner Wellander. Here. Commissioner McDonald. Here. Present. And Chair Felder. Present. And with that, would you put on the flag so we can do the pledge, please? Yes, it will just be one moment. Wendy, uh, Jim Boharzen, can you please promote the panelist? Yes. Thank you. Just one moment. Oh, you got music going on. When did you see him? I'm just trying to get the flag up. Oh, just sit tight, Jim. Uh, all right. If you will all join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Wendy. Um, before we get going here, uh, any decision reached by the planning commission tonight may be appealed to the city council. Appeals must be filed with the city clerk within 15 calendar days following the planning commission decisions unless the 15th day falls on a weekend or holiday. Uh, with that, we have- Did you get the audio going though? Hey, there we go. Good evening, uh, Commissioner Bohar. I, uh, I'm here, but I can't hear very much. Okay. I'll go on to item uh, 3.1, which is the public pro process comment process for this meeting. Uh, the public is able to join uh, the, the meeting through Zoom or a smartphone, in which case uh, you can find the information. No, it sounds like it's in the background. The website. Or you can also join the Zoom meeting on a regular phone. Public comment will be accepted uh, if you're using Zoom uh, by raising your hand and you will give it, be given a prompt to confirm you can uh, speak, or you can email public comment uh, to the uh, email address public comment at sonomacity.org, which can be submitted at any time. But if it's if you want it entered in the record, it has to be uh, submitted prior to the close of the uh, public comment period for the item. With that, we will move to item four, which is comments from the public for items not appearing on the agenda. Welcome to our planning director, Mr. Storr. Uh, if there's anyone, if you can tell if there's anyone that wants to give public comment, Wendy. I don't see anyone raising their hand, and right now I'm checking for a written public comment. Just one moment. There is no written comment, no okay. public comment. Thank you. We will move to item five, which is review and acceptance of the agenda. So uh, does anyone have anything that they want to uh, change on the agenda? I might point out that uh, at the request of the applicant, item 8.3, which is the uh, property at 32 Patton Street, uh, has is being requested to be continued to the meeting of June, July 9th at the request of the applicant. Uh, 
So we will not hear that item tonight. And if I could cl clarify, there was an issue with that. That was at, uh, an, an issue with processing the permit from uh, Public Works and Planning, not from the applicant. Thank you. All right. And uh, with that, are there any uh, late correspondence, Wendy? You're muted. You're still muted, Wendy. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, all the public comment that was received was downloaded to the document folder on the city's website. Thank you. Uh, then we will move on to the consent calendar and all items on the consent calendar considered to be routine will be acted upon by a single motion. No separate discussion unless members of the planning commission staff or the public uh, request items to be removed. Uh, with that, we only have one item, which is the uh, minutes for the regular meeting of May 14th. Uh, anyone want to pull uh, that item? Seeing none, I will take a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. I'll second that. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, let me do a roll call vote. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. Commissioner Barbos. Aye. Commissioner Kelso Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Larry Barnett. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner Bohar. Aye. Commissioner Wellander. Yes. And Chair Felder. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will move on to the public hearing. The first item on the public hearing is consideration, discussion, and possible action to approve a use permit amendment and parking exception to relocate a previously approved permanent generator for MacArthur Place, Hotel and Spa, uh, and to modify the parking lot at 29 East MacArthur Street, including an action to approve a categorical exemption uh, on CEQA. And with that, I will go to our staff person, uh, Christina, to give us a report. Thank you all. Nice to see everyone. So I have a little delay with my PowerPoint. Okay, so this, can everyone see? Yep. Okay, perfect. So the project before you is a, a minor variation from what was considered and approved by the Planning Commission in G, uh, January of this year. So in January, MacArthur Place was before the Planning Commission for approval of two emergency permanent emergency power generators. The western one was approved as proposed. The eastern generator, if everyone recalls, was conditioned at the meeting to be located outside of the creek setback in parking lot 17. When the applicant went through the building permit process, they realized that the enclosures and fencing were just slightly larger than the parking space allowed. And so in order to stay in parking lot 17, a portion of those structures would have been within the creek setback. So in lieu of coming back to the Planning Commission and requesting that a portion of that, that structure encroach into the creek setback, um, the voice at the January meeting was pretty clear that the commission did not support any kind of an encroachment in the creek setback. And as an alternative, they have flipped the generator about 90 degrees perpendicular. And um, at, in order to accommodate that, they are also requesting that six of the parking spaces that are adjacent to the generator have a have dimensions in depth that are slightly shorter than what our standard would allow. Staff supports this recommendation as the MacArthur Place parking program is 100% a valet program. So trained professionals would be parking cars in these locations, not members of the public. So the, the issues associated with um, the members of the public parking large cars in the small parking spaces would be alleviated. So just for a brief overview, there's the location of this, the hotel and spa. And it's a total 5.1 acre site bordered by Broadway to the west, East MacArthur to the north, and Nathanson Creek to the east. 
the current hotel has 64 guest rooms and the adjacent land uses include the Sonoma Valley High School to the south, the former auto dealer site and some mixed residential and parkland to the north, a park to the east and some various commercial and mixed uses to the west. It's located in the Broadway corridor and is zoned mixed use. And what's before the commission now, apologies for the tiny font, um, as I mentioned, is really just moving that previously approved Western generator. So all of the conditions of approval with the generator, none of that has changed. Those um, are all associated with the use of the actual generator, which has been, um, been addressed already. This is just looking at the, the revised location. The design review has already been approved. So the current application would, um, Again, just flip it 90 degrees perpendicular, and then the parking exception is for six of the parking spaces adjacent to the western side of the generator to be eight and a half feet wide by 16 feet deep. Uh, additionally, and partly related, the applicant is proposing to restripe the entire parking lot to include some compact spaces. Currently, all of the parking spaces are standard 10 by 20 spaces. And they're requesting that 30% uh, be compact spaces as allowed by the code. And the, the uh, inclusion of the compact spaces does not require a parking exception. It's just an amendment to the use permit for the Planning Commission to review the revised parking. As part of the modifications to the western lot, three trees are being proposed to be removed. Are there any questions? Questions to staff? I have a question. I have a question. Go ahead, yes. Jill. Okay. Have the trees already been removed? I would have to have let the applicant speak to that. I, I don't have information about that. And this this um, plan they're asking for approval has already been executed, correct? Correct. In anticipation of the power outages, they did go ahead and build the structure. They're not currently operational and are waiting on their building permit for that. So the last city council meeting, our city manager said that there probably is not going to have any power outages in town anymore. That PG&E is going to really try to only have the power shutoffs in the hills. And so, you know, when we say in anticipation of the power shutoffs, I, you know, I, I don't see that happening here. But I guess the, the bigger question I have is, um, do they need a building permit to build this? They did submit for a building permit, and that's how we ended up uh, where we are. That part of the building permit was, my understanding is that part of the building permit was approved, so the east, the western generators were approved. And um, I, I. Because typically you need a building permit, or you need a use permit. Is Are, are they applying for a use permit here? They're applying for a use permit for the new location, correct? Correct. So on the building permit, it says generally use permit checked off that they've received planning approval from the. Uh, yeah, I can't. I can't comment on that. I have not signed off a building permit for the generator for that specific location. I did sign off on one for the western. So they did not have a building permit for this. I, I would have to check the records. I, I'm not aware. Well, of I don't think they could because you, you generally need planning approval before building permit yeah, you know so i don't know that i can't recall off the top of my head the specific uh dimensions of the structure some structures don't require building permits the fencing for example does not require a building permit and so i don't believe that has a roof i believe it's just a fence enclosure and so that does not need a building permit building a concrete I'm, I'm pad does not require a building it. permit for this i mean you need a building permit to put a new heater in your house I mean, Correct. I, I, and so the generator has not been installed. My understanding is it's sitting in place. So the fencing itself was uh, is built to, if it's built to code, it does not need a building permit. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what was the reason uh, to have to remove the trees? I will let the applicant speak to that. My understanding, it's just part of the restriping process, but they can answer that better. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, also on the trees, I, I would like to know specifically about these trees, the size, the species, and the location. I'm pulling that up on your screen. And are they have they already been removed? 
Yeah, I can't answer the question uh, whether they have been. Still there. So there's a four inch oak, two four inch oaks and a six inch oak. They're relatively small. So Wallander, were you at the site today? Yes, and uh, there are seven existing trees I believe there, uh, the majority of them are Corcus virginiana or swamp oak, and there is one cork oak that's at the uh, at the bend in the parking lot, right in the north, uh, north, uh, the north little peninsula. But the trees are there. Okay, I guess the the question is. Uh, uh, whether those trees have to be removed uh, since they're just creating additional parking spaces that would put them in excess of, of what is required. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. I can't answer that question. Is that uh, uh, up for our approval? The tree removal. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions to staff? Being none. Oh, I see one. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, Christina, have we dealt prior with those containers that are uh, in the center of the west parking lot? There's seven of them, I think. My understanding is that the containers are storing furniture during the remodel, so those should be removed when the construction's finished. Okay. I thought those were... Uh, the replacement for storage area where the uh, Easter generator is, but that's not true, huh? No, they they built new um, new structures for the for the storage, and those uh, the temporary ones are are gone, as far as I remember. I see. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? I don't see any hands or anything raised. Uh, so with that, we'll open the public hearing. Would the applicant care to speak? Joe, I see you on. Did, were you intending to say anything? Muted. I'm, I'm muted. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you see me? I think you're coming. Oh, okay. I can there you go. and see everyone. And I believe Michael had a quick um, PowerPoint presentation. Was he gonna, is he joining? Uh, Michael, are you on the call? I don't see him on here. Wendy, do you see Michael Ross as an attendant? I just promoted him. Thank you. Yeah, I can answer a few of the questions that came up. Um, and uh, I th think maybe Michael could uh, um, show the PowerPoint he wanted to present. There he is. Hello. Good to see you all. Um, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Um, well, thank you for hearing this. Um, uh, and considering this uh, use permit application. Um, this is a view of the existing conditions. And throughout the construction process, one of the things that we heard was an, on the need to increase the amount of parking. And so when we learned that the new generator location was contingent on uh, restriping and resurfacing, we elected to um, see if we could maximize the amount of parking on site. And that's what we're um, before you tonight to request your approval of. And um, during that process, we um, also uh, met with the fire marshal and this corner right here where you see my cursor in uh, the, I don't see the shared screen right now. You can't see anything. You can't see anything. Well, that's not good. Um, let's see. Display settings. 
There's a should be a box at the bottom to share the screen. Yeah, I'm looking for that. Right in the middle on the bottom. Any change there? No. Yeah. Okay, just for a second. Share a screen. There we go. Can you see it now? No. Do you want me to share, Michael? Well, let's. I would like to do it. It should uh, work. Screen one. Okay, good. There we go. There we go. All right. Hi. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. Good. Okay, so um, this is the um, existing site conditions. I apologize for the um, share screen incident. Um, Excuse me, are you showing a, a site plan now? As existing site conditions, it says. Okay, I don't see anything on my screen. I see uh, an old background. All I've got is uh, six small panels on the right side of uh, you members. How can I get the uh, main screen back? Can somebody help me? Did anybody else see my screen? I can't. Yeah. I did. Now it's. it's uh, yeah. Jim, if you go to the top, uh, there should be a box that. Uh, uh, Michael is sharing the screen and there are view options. In the top right hand corner there, if you hover up at the top, there's um, view options. Um, I'm not seeing that. Go ahead. I, I'll just uh, wing it from here. I'm not, I'm not getting that. It's fine. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, when we shifted the location out of space 17, uh, to the, um, new location for the east side generator, it required modifications to the compact space requirement to, um, along that area that was going to require resurfacing and repaving of that area. And it was also the desire of the hotel management to resurface the existing lots and uh, restripe them before they reopen. And so um, consistent with uh, reports from the neighborhood that we needed to provide more parking, we started looking for opportunities to do so. And we found out that there were 10 candidate spaces that we could add to the overall count. Uh, and that's what we're reviewing uh, this evening. And um, what we're asking you to consider is to allow us to add these 10 new parking spaces, which would increase our off street parking count from 121 to 131 spaces, allow us to relocate the east side generator to where, uh, albeit we understand where it's built right now, but it's outside of the Crete site side setback. And, uh, Throughout this process of um, developing the um, plan, we met with the fire marshal and learned that um, the existing corner in the west lot um, no longer met the current turn radius. So we wanted to correct that. And um, what we're proposing to do is to modify the six compact spaces from a city standard. Uh, which is approximately eight and a half feet by 18 feet and to use a county standard which is around nine feet by 16 foot seven or so uh, i believe the county standard is actually smaller santa rosa is also smaller and per the um, recommendations uh, of the fire marshal we're going to delete one space in the west lot to uh, allow the largest uh, fire apparatus into that lot and in order to pick up um, the 30 foot turn radius, we need to shift some spaces uh, along MacArthur four feet into the planning strip and along Broadway four feet into the planning strip. 
and um, at the request of the fire marshal, we're going to restripe some of the valet spaces as last parked. That's uh, to, at, towards the far south end of the lot. And in uh, order to make all these changes, we're requesting the approval of uh, removing three existing trees, those small oaks that you saw um, uh, today, and relocate two of the trees adjacent to Broadway. This whole um, mix will then allow the 30 foot emergency uh, turn radius to be created. And the proposed um, site uh, location or conditions will be what you see in the screen. And the spaces that are moving um, north are right in this corner. Can you see my cursor? Yep. OK, good. And then the spaces that are um, moving west are um, right in along this area. And that allows this to provide a 30 foot turn radius. This space here is being deleted because when the fire apparatus came in, it, it cleared it, but just barely. And uh, likewise, it cleared in the existing conditions, but it didn't meet um, the um, NFPA standards for turn radius or the uh, current codes. And so uh, allowing us to do this will allow us to um, make this critical turn correct for fire apparatus. We realize that uh, we're requesting the removal of three trees, but um, I can vouch for um, the hotel for every tree that um, is going to be removed be removed, at least two are going to be replaced brand new. They already have started um, a really extensive replanting of trees uh, in the great lawn here. They just placed six beautiful trees. And um, I know that they are, uh, they value all the trees. Uh, at the same time, they would like to increase the parking count to uh, allow more on site parking and reduce the temptation for. Uh, on street parking. And the generator re relocation over here, um, it is constructed. It was constructed um, per code and documented during that. And um, it was largely because of the COVID delays uh, across the industry and at the city. Um, there was no sense at all that PG&E was going to um, avoid turning off the power. And in order to minimize disruption to the business, it's already had some real challenges to its economic resilience from 2017 with the wildfires, the, um, the loss of power in 2018, and now COVID. Um, the construction went on uh, concurrent with the West Side generator in order to get this ready for the fire season. So um, um, we're aware of that process. It was not built uh, with the permit approved, but it was built according to um, all the engineer documents and fully documented throughout the process. And Joe can speak to that, I know. Um, so that is a brief overview. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have questions of I Michael? Do. I do. Mm -hmm. Chair right. Council. Yeah, okay. Um, my first question is, from what I understand, Michael, when we approved this a few years ago, you had a parking bank, or you had about I think more than 10 spaces banked. Yes. Is that correct? Is that That's correct. Is that still the case? Uh, now we have 11 banked. Okay, so you have 11 banked. And so I guess my question is, why would you need 10 more when you've already got 11 free spaces? Meaning you already have more than enough parking on this site to provide for everything that's going on on the site. So why would we... I mean, the only reason why I think you would need more space is if you want to do more things with the site, add more square feet, more hotel rooms, et cetera. It has nothing to do with parking on the street, in my view. It has to do with, um, you know, banking as much potential parking spaces for future opportunities. And so I don't know why we would need to add 
or give you 10 more spaces right now when you already have 11 more spaces than you need? Well, the 11 spaces were um, in excess of the 109 that were assigned um, to the current use permit. Um, but we believe, you know, parking is a big topic in our community. We believe adding more parking is a good thing for this hotel. And the hotel, it provides additional value to it. And the hotel will likely be back in the future with um, other projects for your consideration. Right now is a good time to do it because we would like to um, get all of this paving and uh, restriping work done before the hotel reopens and avoid annoying our guests again. You know, I understand that. And so, so you are saying there are future projects because that would be helpful to know what we're assigning these parking spaces for. It's not necessarily to help the street situation because you know, I mean, if if I was looking at it, I would look at, well, now we have 20 spaces to play with. How many more rooms are we going to add? How many more square feet of spa are we going to add? Where right. it's really not a street situation. In my right. Opinion. Well, the street situation definitely was a hot topic uh, during the construction. And Kelso, I understand your, your points. I think they're uh, extremely valid. And um, it's likely we will be bef before you in the future with uh, additional projects. Right now is an optimum time to restripe and do that work. And, um, you know, what's interesting, everything is so interrelated on the site. Those, um, Jim, you saw those uh, containers out there in the West Lot. Um, the West Lot containers really are part of the sort of the storage ecosystem on the campus. There isn't enough storage and we need to build more so we can get rid of those things. And so that's part of it as well. Right now they're um, storing hotel goods in there and um, we wanna get those off site as soon as we can. Sorry, it's all- just add that our parking standards and the development code, those are minimum parking standards. We don't require any use to have a specific number of spaces. It's up to each applicant to determine how many spaces above the minimum they feel is needed for their particular business. If some, I have a question. If some of the uh, intent of creating these extra on-site parking places was to relieve the uh, street parking, what assurance do we have that employees will begin to use the parking lot as opposed to the street? And can we make that a formal condition before we approve this? But we, we've made that a condition before and it hasn't happened. Well, that's why I'm bringing it up again. Um, can, I would like to have Joe Walsh, who's uh, on this call, to be able to speak to the operational nature of the hotel and that very issue, Bob and Kelso. Okay, if we could uh, get uh, Joe to activate his mic. Okay, can I, am I heard? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, nice to see everyone today. Um, to answer a few of the questions, um, there still are containers on the site. Those containers, um, some of them are storing uh, furniture that's been stored uh, during the closure of the hotel. And we're hoping the hotel can open approximately July 1st. And I'm hoping to get the parking lot ceiling, which is a pretty simple capital project, um, but it's, it's a bit messy. Um, I'm hoping to get that work done. There's a minimal paving under this plan, basically, to address the turning radius that uh, Chief uh, Smith has asked us to do. Um, those containers, uh, we still are going to have a plan in the future to add a couple more storage units. The storage units, if you go back in time, were all in the creek setback, and one of the conditions was we had to remove them. Um, operating a five-star hotel, um, we don't exactly have enough space as needed. So we're coming back in the future for a couple more storage um, areas. Um, and as Michael had said, we've been uh, in the process of design of the spa. The spa project will require parking. Um, the spa project will have more back of the house, which is drastically needed um, at the hotel right now. But um, the fact of having more spaces, I think is a good thing. Um, sure, we would like to have more than required. Um, you know, every time I meet with the 
Uh, every time I've been to planning commission, there's been one neighbor that's uh, historically had issues with parking. Uh, we've asked the staff to park on site and Ruben and Greg are developing a plan to do so. Um, I still need to help them get those trailers uh, removed, but um, we're, we're happy to have a condition that the, the staff park on site and ensure that that happens. Um, if I could hit a few of the other items, um, the three trees that are shown, uh, they can be relocated and uh, we put that we would remove them just in the event that we couldn't relocate them. They're fairly small, but we of course treasure the trees. And I think as Michael said, we, we replaced well over uh, two for any tree that we've removed. So we would replant those on the Southern side. Um, I just listed as removal just in case we had to do that. On the building permit, um, we do have a building permit for the West generator and we have a building permit for the East generator. The permit wasn't approved because we go back to the planning commission once we had to relocate the space. We thought space 17 was fine. Christina uh, advised us that a third of it was in the creek setback. So when we went to come back to planning commission, of course, there was the shutdown. So it was a bit of a conundrum. Um, I applied for a building application two times to a conclusion with the building department that we would pull out the east side generator, the pad and the fence, and we would resubmit to get all the electrical work done. So all that work is underway this week. We did pour the slab. Uh, we had it inspected per code. Uh, we built part of the fence per code. Uh, and I thought that that was appropriate. I didn't want to be doing that work um, once the hotel opened back up, uh, hopefully July 1st. Um, Mr. Chair, if I can just add a couple of comments and then uh, while we have Joe um, and, uh, available to us, I do feel, uh, I want to reiterate what Christina said earlier. Uh, most municipal codes with off street parking are minimum standards, as she said. And the best example I can give you of a problem in that regard is as, as opposed to putting a maximum, which some jurisdictions do is the, I'll refer to it as the, the Walmart effect. As you've been to a Walmart throughout the US, you see that they over park, but they do park for that one period of time during a year between November and Christmas, New Year's, so that they can accommodate all the parking that they have. And then during that downtime, they allow people to park RVs and things like that. And so. Yes, there's an unreasonable amount or unusual amount of space that's left vacant throughout the year. This is not the case, but um, certainly you uh, you could uh, require a minimum number of employees that shall use the off street parking spaces. But I'd, I'd ask you to, be, to to come somewhat short of saying employees are prohibited from parking on street. So if we can kind of just flip that piece to, you know, if they've got you know, 75 employees there on a day, on any given day, say that there shall be 75 employees parking on, on site or something like that. That'd be my recommendation to you. Thank you. Um, I did Chair, have one other, am I still able to speak? Yes. Oh, sorry, on the question of the generators, uh, Commissioner Kelso had, had uh, asked about that. The challenge isn't really if, it, if an outage happens or not. Um, the, you know, the hotel, I think, is going to run 35% occupancy this year. And we all know nationally, globally, locally, um, there's been, you know, this drastic interruption. The hospitality business, you know, feels it uh, very, very seriously. It's more of a threat. So when someone's booking their, you know, high-end wedding or they're booking a corporate group, us being able to say with certainty that we have backup generators and we have power, is what the ownership wanted to do. Uh, we've spent a uh, half million dollars, uh, approved a half million dollars for the project, uh, and the project is uh, still going on. So uh, the owner has really said that we have to have the generators um, because the sales staff and the team has said that's what gives us a major competitive advantage and really mitigates some of the fallout that we saw last time. We had fallout last, uh, last year, even though we had backup generators, just out of the fear of the fact that there might not be power. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I could just add to what uh, Commissioner Barnett mentioned earlier, the at the last council meeting, and I will talk about this in uh, director updates later, um, there are no guarantees that there won't be a PSPS. We're, we're very fortunate to have had the last three out of the last four, if you recall during that period of time where we only were lim we were limited to the uh, luckily most of the city got power it was the area on first street west 
around in and around the fire department. And maybe I think there were some over on uh, Brazil or, or Lavelle Valley uh, Road, but um, we just don't know. So we will be, you know, uh, modifying the municipal code uh, with respect to generators allowing for an exemption for their use. But I think what Joe is saying here is he needs it for an alternative purpose, and that is to provide some form of security to his customers. And I would just add that although the city itself and most of the city didn't shut down in the last few, I know that personally lots of friends who were in the county did have their power shut off. For example, my parents had their power shut off for almost two weeks. And um, a lot of people were using MacArthur Place as a resource. They were going there and charging. So I'm very grateful for the benefit. So I appreciate that. I have a Mr. question for um, Mr. Chair. I have a quick question. Dave, David Storr, planning director Storr. Um, did anyone, I mean, I assume everyone at the city knew this was happening. Did anyone from the city say, go ahead? I, uh, I don't know. I'd have to defer to Christina. I know that she was working with, uh, with the architects and uh, the owners. Did yeah, you, I mean, so Christina, this- did you say, just go ahead? No, we did not say go ahead. Um, very often this happens where people will go ahead and make a decision that it's in, uh, they need to move ahead. And typically we don't get any kind of courtesy or a uh, heads up. And I'm very grateful that Joe let us know that it was happening. Um, I, could we have gone and put a stop work order potentially, but the, the fence didn't need a building permit. It's built, it's built to code, our code does not require and California building code doesn't require the fence to have a permit. So I, I don't think they did anything wrong with that. And the generator is not hooked up um, to the electri electricity yet. That does require a building permit. And as soon as it is approved in that location, I'm sure they will be, it's already submitted. And so I just need to sign off as soon as um, the location is approved. But the hooking up of the electricity does require a building permit and they cannot hook up the electrical until they have that permit. All right, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes, Commissioner Larry Barnett. Uh, I wanna go back to this parking for a minute. Um, uh, is there any consideration been given to assigning parking spaces within the property boundaries to employees? In other words, I'm sure every space in your internal plan has a number. And, you know, if, if, if Joe has a space that's his space and assigned to him and it's a number then he knows that's where he's going to park and even if it were a part-time person and a space was going to be shared between people who split positions um it seems to me it'd be helpful for people to know okay this is my space when i come to work this is where i park and that kind of removes this option from the street i i will confess that from time to time when i had stopped by the hotel to get some coffee when you were open and I do look forward to you being open again so I can do that uh, that I've seen I've seen employees or they may be contract employees uh, walking out of the property walking on to the uh, uh, residential street nearby and getting in their car and taking off so there are definitely employees parking on the streets there's no question about that and I'm and I'm wondering if it would uh, make sense to just assign spaces to people and have those basically blocked. I can, if you can hear me, I can answer that. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. That, that's a very good suggestion. Um, and just to reiterate, I think we have drastically um, resolved the parking issue with our community. Um, now, obviously the hotel has been closed for three months, but since I came and apologized over the parking issues some seven months ago, um, we've worked diligently to have staff on site. Do some staff park on the street? Yes. I've spoken to Ruben. I want to get this plan completed so that we have no construction disrupting them. Um, we've installed the valet gate. The valet gate's automatic. Uh, the plan is to have the employees park in the west lot. The challenge is with the ebb and flow of employees in hotels, um, you, you don't have one spot per employee. And then um, our parking plan, it's like a church on Easter. Um, you have events where you have many more uh, cars than normal uh, every once in a while. It's not an everyday occurrence. And that's our, uh, part of our challenge is to be sure that we, we keep the commitment that we made to the neighbors to keep um, the overflow off the street. And I think with this plan, 
the ceiling and striping, the completion of the generators, because all these things disrupt the employee parking. And then the removal of the containers, uh, we still need additional um, storage. We can get to the Harmony where all the employees are always parked um, at site. Commissioner Weldon, did your hand was up. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. A uh, couple questions. I'm looking at the tree plan and I'm just confused. When I was at the site today, there were seven trees located um, in the west parking lot. And it was, and as I'm looking at the drawing now of the tree plan with the cute green dots, I can't, it's hard for me to understand of those seven, which three are being removed? Because I don't see seven dots, even with the three dark ones eliminated. So I'm, I'm on confused. The on the tree plan, I don't know, uh, Christina, if you have the exhibit, um, there are three, three oak trees that are on the- I do, but I think it's Michael's presentation that's at. Oh. Well, uh, it's- I'll, 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 Can you see my screen? No, I can't, but I'm looking at the drawing that you submitted in the package and the legend shows trees to be removed, three total, existing trees to remain. Uh, Unless my math is incorrect, I count three dark trees to be removed and two to remain, which equals five. And I counted seven trees. So um, I want to know what's what. Um, well, what's what is you're looking at a um, uh, an old diagram that was submitted with the use permit and um, the original use permit application. And then subsequent to that, we met with the fire marshal, which um, triggered these changes in the shifts in those spaces. So I'll, uh, and, and you're entirely correct, Ron, what you're looking at is confusing uh, because it's a uh, earlier diagram. Can you see my cursor on the screen? Uh, I am looking at the screen and I'm old and can't see the cursor, but go ahead. Maybe you can just walk. Me okay. So you got the three dark dots. Those are right. the three small oak trees that are being proposed to be removed. And then okay. when you go directly west and up, these two trees right here, the ones closest to the um, clipped corner on Broadway are going to be relocated and shifted because we're moving some of those spaces towards the west. Are so those the two pine trees? No, not the pine trees. I think they're camphor trees. Okay. Yeah. And so there's adjustments. And because the trees are of um, some stature, um, the uh, landscaper who is out there is also an arborist. They recommended that we relocate them as compared to removing them. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. Okay. Uh, so some of the rest of the confusion, uh, Michael, is that uh, there were more trees in place along that strip where the trees are coming out than what you're showing on the diagram. Yeah, it's only yeah. There's only two, three that are coming out along the east side of the lot, and two that are being shifted up here by the clipped corner and right yeah that's it okay all right i got it. so i have a couple more questions so when you're talking about needing to improve the turning radius at the bend and there's an existing cork oak a small one you're not having to relocate that oak or pull back striping on it or decrease the the uh -huh. peninsula uh, according to my understanding no but okay. um I can answer it. How, I'm not that much uh, aware of that cork oak. How big, big is it, Ron? Not, it's not big. It was probably a four, four inch. It wasn't big. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, so we planted we planted that tree uh, during the renovation. And that, okay. that corner meets the code. Um, okay. And just by pushing those other spaces, uh, that tree stays. Um, it's got a bollard protecting it. And then okay. the 30 uh, foot turning radius. Okay, great. Um, I do have though in the discussion about removing trees, historically uh, this project has done a, a good job of screening this large parking lot from Broadway. But like many of us who get a little long in the tooth, we begin to show our wear. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I am not real excited about removing trees that add a certain softening if the veil along Broadway is beginning to be thin, which when I was there today looked rather modest for the five star quality that you present. So can you speak at all to whether um, you're looking at upgrading the screening along Broadway at all? Um, we currently um, have a, a landscape contractor. It's our arborist. Um, I haven't noticed that uh, th there's, I mean, we've, I think, done a great job of caring for the trees since we've arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, we've planted, every time we've, we've come and said, we're going to remove trees. So all the red oaks south of Layla, they were originally recommended to be removed. I, I, I wouldn't let anyone move any trees. We kept all those trees. So all of the trees on site, um, we have really worked diligently to work around um, okay. as we're doing with the future spa. But I think right now um, with the row that's in the tree lawn on Broadway, plus the internal, um, I think the hotel's well screened. I, I, if, if you prefer. Joe, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, um, if there were um, holes, so to speak, in that, um, that row of trees or something like that. I'm sure the hotel would be willing to plant a tree or two to fill in any gaps. Of course. Yeah, yeah and, and it's less trees, I guess, to be more specific. There's a, um, a privet hedge that Suzanne Brangham planted eons ago when it was first developed. And it's been an effective evergreen hedge to play down the visual impact of that parking lot. And as I said earlier, sometimes as we get a little longer in the tooth, they begin to be less effective in the terms of the screen. I'm less interested in more trees. I'm just saying that if you take out some existing foliage that fronts that large fence, which almost suggests the backside of a project, and then you have uh, less than a vigorous screen along Broadway, it, it, it makes me a little bit uh, unenthusiastic about removing trees, but I'm, I'm just, it's, this is discussion. I'm not stating anything black and white. Well, to, to clarify the, the, the border, there's two borders on Broadway. There's the tree lawn border, and then there's the inside the picket fence. We are not um, removing any of those trees. We're just moving two of them each uh, to the west. Right. The right. ones we're moving are more on the internal, um, the internal side of the parking lot. No, and, and I, I appreciate that. I'm just speaking to the imagery of, of that West parking lot from Broadway, so. Right, um, we'd be happy to do additional planting if, if the uh, commission okay. think we need some. Okay, thank you, Joe. Welcome. Any other questions of the applicant? I have a question, Chair Filner. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, this is a uh, question for Michael Ross uh, about the uh, restriping Refresh my memory on how many standard spaces are going to be reduced to compact size. Six. Well, excuse me. There's um, there's the city compact size, Jim, and then there is um, the county and city of Santa Rosa compact size. We're reducing um, our compact size down to a um, a smaller version of it that we're using a county standard. There's six total in the uh, east lot next to the new generator location. And Michael, you said that the uh, the width is actually going to increase, if I heard correctly. That's right. The width is going to increase, but the length is going to shorten. So only six standard spaces will be affected. Is that is that it? That's correct. Yeah. Well, this may not be relevant, but I, I would like to make the comment. You've increased with the the new transition of the uh, facility. You've increased the sophistication of the food and the environment and the bar and so forth. And prices have risen. You're going to have a much more sophisticated clientele there, based on what I'm hearing from the local residents who go there or used to go there. It seems surprising that it, it seems that very few people that are going to be visiting there are going to be driving compact cars. And I wonder if that's not going to put a strain on the parking situation and this addition is going to put an additional one on it. You're not going to put a Porsche Macan in a, you know, small space and there's going to be tons of cars like that, don't you think? Well, um, point well taken, but um, that's only six um, shorter compact spaces 
in 131 spaces. So I think we'll be fine in that regard. And um, there are a few amount, of, the fair amount of people who are driving um, smaller cars that we could fit into there, and for that matter, Boys. including some staff. Yeah. And, and did I hear Michael that uh, this is going to be an area where you've got ballet? And secondly, um, these are six of the eleven overage uh, spaces that you're talking about, correct? As That's a, correct. As opposed to the minimum that's required under the code. Thank you. Y yes. Let me add something more to that, Michael, if you don't mind. Um, the, the one of, one of the mysteries about the, about the valet parking, there, there was some discussion about that a year and a half ago, and I think there was only one one serious concern commission member about that. Since then, I'm, I I thought a lot about it, particularly when I saw a lot of cars on the street. Uh, the mystery that is unknown right now is local people that come there may be very reluctant to coming down for coffee or lunch or a drink the locals are i think are going to be reluctant to some extent not to valet park their cars because people a lot of people want to control their cars or, you know they're not going to be there for three days they're only going to be there for an hour or two and they're going to park on the street have you given any consideration to that that it's going to put pressure on what originally was uh relegated to valet parking well, I think that you're um, accurately describing a, um, a phenomenon with the neighbors that um, some people do do that. But I'm aware of um, a lot of locals who go to Layla for dinner or things like that. They come in and it's sort of part of the whole procession and ceremony of coming to um, the hotel where you, the valet picks it up. It's, um, it's a no cost issue and uh, it's just part of it all. Um, in the evening time in particular, I know that the valet parking is um, used uh, extensively. Thank you. Yeah, I think if there's no further questions of the applicant, uh, we'll open the uh, public hearing to the rest of the public if anyone cares to speak. Uh, if we can unshare the, the screen. So I don't see any members of the public raising their hand and I'm checking for written correspondence and there is none. Okay, so then we can close the public uh, comment period, the public hearing. You're muted, Wendy. My, Are we able? Uh, my apologies. We can go ahead and, and close the public hearing. Yes. Okay. Bring it back to the commission for discussion and possible action. Anyone want to start? I have a question. Okay, Kelso. Um, and I guess this question would be for David or Christina or Wendy. Um, can we make a condition of approval that if additional parking spaces are added, recognizing the situation and the stress the parking has been on the current use that additional parking spaces can't be used for any expansion of use that they are just additional parking spaces for the current use well just like uh your municipal code has a minimum you can place a, a total number on how many you want to have on site uh, as far as restricting their use i mentioned that you could require them to use 10 spaces for employee parking or 20 spaces um, you can do something like that. Uh, can I speak? So we, so, we can, so we can condition it that way. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? I have a question. Oh, Mary? Just a minute. Yeah. It, it present. Um, uh, you mentioned that the Western parking area was for employees, or at least that's what I heard. Um, is it, well, do we know, for example, Christina, is the, are those spaces, is there a sign that says employee parking only? Are, are things designated in that specific way? 
I don't know. Um, Joe might be able to comment, but a uh, common requirement would could be uh, for the commission to consider is the creation of a parking plan. And some <clears throat> of those issues could be put down in more detail. Okay, thank you. I, I personally like that idea. Thank you. I, I can answer that question. Do you wish? Go ahead, Joe. Okay, um, so the, the, the way it works with the parking is typically when the customers are overnight customers are away, we have, it's an ebb and flow. We have most of the employees on site, but customers can't park their own car. So when I said they're for employees, the employees have the gate code so they can open up the valet gate um, and then drive in and park, but it's shared use. So at night, it would probably be a, overnight would be a customer um, a parking spot. And in the daytime, when the vast majority of the employees are there, housekeeping, maintenance and such, uh, that same spot could be used by an employee, but it's not um, specifically assigned. There, it's a bit of an ebb and flow. But for the West lot, the, uh, the customers are, uh, do not have access. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. So when the customer pulls in, if you, if then the, the valet quickly um, takes control of the drive and, um, and takes the car from the customer. So the customer doesn't have the ability to park in our parking lot. And so how many spaces are in the West lot roughly uh, michael do you know that answer it's on the civil plan i'll have to um you give me a moment i can look it up sir i'm guessing 85. so christina oh. christina you said you suggested a parking plan and that's what commissioner larry barnett suggested he liked what would that entail um, so in some other projects that I've seen, the condition would be the requirement of a parking management plan, and it could outline what parking would look like for larger events when they're at full capacity, um, how to deal with evening flow, things like that, directing and designating certain and certain parking spaces for employees, things like that. But we don't we don't have there is not a current parking plan, as you described. Not to my understanding. Okay, not so there. shouldn't we see that first? Your commission could certainly request or require that to be a condition of approval, or you could uh, continue the matter until once created and presented to you. Okay. Sheila, did you have a question or comment? Um, yeah, my question is related to a lot of the comments so far. And it's even if we require a certain number of the parking spaces to be designated as employees, how is that enforced? So typically what I've seen, if you do a parking management plan, there's some kind of a biennial or um, you know, quarterly report. When I worked for the county, we would do quarterly reports for San Domenico School and lots of the, the higher um, trafficked areas. It's kind of a, a normal process where sometimes planning staff goes out and does it. Sometimes the applicant commissions a report um, to monitor the street parking. It's pretty it's pretty, um, as, a, as a local, to me, it seems pretty easy to see uh, when the employees are parking on the street and walking in and out. That's something that could be pretty easily monitored. I guess my issue with that is in 2017 or 18, whenever we did this, and I, you know, I was on the planning commission at the time, and I didn't support this valet parking program because I thought everyone would end up parking on the street, which is actually what has occurred. And so my question, and back then in the conditions of approval, we said, all employees need to park on site and that hasn't occurred and so yeah. I guess what i'm saying is why would you say we could do this this and the other thing when we've already done that and nothing has happened no, you know it i think it's in the way that you write the condition if you say that the the report need the annual report needs to go back to the planning commission or to be reviewed by staff or the planning director then there's the hook if you just say everybody shall park on the street there's no way to enforce it mr chair one of the things you could do is if there's a frequency or event type of thing, you could do it once a quarter. You can even have this item come back and return to your commission as well. Uh, within six months from now, nine months from now, the city's had a history of doing that. Can I speak? Yes, go ahead, Mike. Um, Kelso, thank you for uh, raising this. I, I, I know that um, the whole notion of valley parking in a way is sort of alien to uh, Sonoma and it's it's different. Um, but the thing I would like to say is that um, if we come back to you with future projects, um, we would like those projects 
uh, judged on the merit of those projects, not judged on some parking spaces. And so uh, I would like to respectfully ask that you not limit these spaces that we're adding to the current use, just acknowledge that they exist. And if, if and when we come back with different projects, look at those based on the merit of the project relative to land use and, and massing and scale or whatever it's gonna be. Uh, and let's not make it a parking issue. Um, right now it's a fairly simple thing. It's, we'd like to add some 10 spaces and um, it's not a lot of spaces. It allows us to um, get them in now and restripe. It's um, so it, in a way it's simpler than what we're talking about. Is we're just gonna, we're trying to add 10 spaces by um, some creative restriping. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Comment? Michael, if I can. Um, Michael, I haven't been doing this uh, very recently, but um, as we have off street parking standards, uh, we obviously have some municipal codes that will say that a certain, you cannot exceed a certain number of handicapped, whether it's 30% of the total for handicap. Uh, I haven't seen, and maybe staff can help me on this one, but have you seen municipal codes for off street parking that, that limit the amount of valet similarly to uh, handicap spaces? I, I'm not remembering or, or recur uh, remembering that. Have you seen that? And Christina? I, honestly, I've never seen a site where it was 100% valet before. Yeah, that, that was my experience. And so I'm just wondering if Michael has seen that elsewhere, because I think that's what I'm hearing from some of the comments that I've heard tonight. Uh, like Christina, uh, I've usually seen it mixed. Mm -hmm. And um, the request for um, in 2017 for the use permit was 100% valet. And that um, was part of the business plan, um, developing a five-star hotel that provides this amenity to everybody free valet parking. And so, um, but to answer your um, question, David, uh, typically I see it mixed. Um, could I add one comment about the, the project? So as Michael said, the ceiling and striping part and then achieving what uh, uh, Chief Smith wants us to do, um, it, given what the hotel has been through, it would be extremely disruptive for the hotel to open July 1st and then for me, August 1st, to empty everyone out of the parking lot for a week to pave, seal, and stripe. So um, my request is that this be approved so we can complete this project while the hotel's closed. So when the hotel staff comes back, we're not in the situation where, you know, we finally have customers back at the hotel and now we're displacing them into the community. And sometimes these projects last for weeks because it starts raining. So there's a very limited time that paving and striping um, can, can effectively be done. Thank you. I would also note that I think that the, the specifics of any parking plan and program should be really carefully looked at. And so I don't know that we wanna make any decisions just on the fly. I would I would support approving the number of spaces and then potentially bringing back a parking management plan to the Planning Commission at a later date. I, I would offer that as a, as a possibility that we, if we went ahead and, and were willing to approve or not uh, the additional parking spaces that we ask uh, uh, them to come back in six months with a parking plan for us to review and then we could uh, decide whether that was sufficient. Um, we could also condition those extra spaces as for providing spaces for the current use and then they can't be used for expansion and then future planning commissions or future projects we could consider dipping into some of those if we've seen a parking management plan if we've seen that um, uh, you know, they've handled it and, and kept employees off the street. If we've seen evidence of a successful parking plan and actually actually seen the plan, then I could see possibly dipping into those extra spaces and, you know, making, making findings at that point. But at this point, they already have 10 more spaces than they need. And so we're going to add another 10. They're going to have 20 more spaces than they need. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, and we're going to be removing trees in the process. And so, I wouldn't want that tide 
to any, right? I wouldn't want that used for any additional project unless we A, knew what the project was and B, knew that they could handle their own parking plan and C, actually have a parking plan. So I would just say that they have more than the minimum that's required by the code. In order to have less than is required by the code, they need a parking exception. Um, my experience working with the Planning Commission is that less than the code has been very strongly rejected as something that we want to consider. So having more parking spaces is not against the code in any way, shape or form. The code's very clear that 30% are allowed to be compact spaces and we have no maximum. We only have the minimum. I don't, as a planner, I don't see any nexus for having a condition of approval limiting the use. We, as a commission, I would, I do uh, highly support looking at how the parking is designated and how it functions with the hotel. Um, if, if I may add, we, we also have been through design review on our spa. Obviously, the the shutdown has delayed timing on everything, but um, our our proposed spa, uh, as we've been through design review, will have an expansion of, of square footage, um, and then we also have to deal with the fact of construction. So with an approved spa project, when we start construction, construction also displaces parking spaces as you now have contractors and items. So um, everything's gotten out of sequence with the, the shutdown of, of business. But um, when we originally came to this plan, we of course knew that we would be coming forward with the spa. We didn't know the, the, the sizing of such, but we will be coming back uh, to you um, with a spa in the, in the near future. How many but just to clarify, Mr. I'm also Chair. processing the spa. There are no additional required parking spaces for the spa. Okay. So, so any of the additional spaces that would be approved tonight are not towards that future project. Mr. So Mr. It, Chair. it would be the construction. Commissioner Bar Larry Barnett. Um, I want to make sure I understand you uh, correctly, Christina. Um, it sounds to me that uh, putting aside this issue of the substandard spaces that are a result of the generator, that this uh, property owner could, without coming to the city for any permission at all, simply restripe their parking system uh, as long as they conform to the legal requirements of the size of the spaces, they could restripe their parking areas any time they want, any way they want to accomplish whatever number they want, as long as they conform to the legal requirements of the size of each space. Am I right? Let me pull up the code real quick. The 30% is definitely allowed. I just don't want to um, speak out of, yeah, out of turn. Christina, while you're looking that up, let me just address a couple of points. Uh, to be clear, the Planning Commission does have discretion because it's a conditional use to be able to say, no, I want you to stick to the minimum. You cannot force them to go above the minimum, but they're choosing, they're requesting that as an applicant. And you have the discretion to say, yes, yeah, we're going to stop at that number of the minimum. What they're doing is, as I mentioned previously, of those that are above the code, they're asking for a change to the, to the length, not the width. They're actually improving a situation on the width. So you do have discretion. When it comes to restriping and resealing, many businesses will rest, uh, resurface their parking lot with new seal coat. It's done all, all the time and the striping occurs. What they can't do is stripe, move 20, you know, make spaces four times as large and turn them 90 degrees. That kind of thing cannot happen. So as it looks and walks type like the dog that was approved in the use permit, that's fine, but you can't change an area of five spaces and make 12 and make them really skinny. You can't turn them into handicapped uh, without, you know, having some kind of uh, authorization through the planning commission. That's the whole point of a conditional use permit is you're tying what has been approved to what has been uh, tying what you're allowing to what the permit says. So they can't just go in there and create 30 more spaces the same way that they can't go back and create a number less than the minimum. Well, I under I understand on the minimum side, uh, but if, for example, they through a creative design uh, and and um, uh, engineering uh, determined that they could increase the number of spaces with that still conform 
to the legal requirements of the size of each space, much as you've noted, if somebody at the Chase at the Chase Bank wants to restripe their parking lot and they realize that if they reduce the size of their garbage enclosure, they can get another space in, they can do it as long as it conforms to the legal requirements of a single space. So I guess what I'm what I'm saying is I'm much more interested in a parking plan that incorporates provisions for some designated employee parking. I understand that there's this issue where you've got a little flip over between day and night and so forth, but that it seems to me if you've got uh, the possibility of a maximum of uh, 75 employee parking spaces, uh, it certainly wouldn't be a handicap to say, okay, there shall be a minimum of 50 on-site employee parking spaces allocated and marked specifically as employee parking and and some sort of parking plan to take into consideration the realities of the specific very large events that may happen occasionally during the year as to the as to the counting of the spaces for the present use i think that that i don't see i understand kelso's point uh i but i don't see that uh the opportunity for a property owner to simply restripe their parking system and end up with more legal parking spaces than they had in the first place um which essentially increases the maximum number of spaces they have on the site really is an area that the city has any legal control over as long as it doesn't change the underlying requirements for handicap parking and the other features that that are absolutely outlined in the use permit as it pertains to parking but adding more spaces as i say if, if chase bank can do it then this hotel ought to be able to do it and i think if the spa changes and other changes in the future trigger parking requirements then as kelso said i think those those uh, projects will have to be evaluated on their own merits, including how much parking at that point is currently available to the public um, on this property. If it would please the commission, I can pull up the code. Okay, go ahead. So parking and loading is regulated by section 1948.040, the number of parking spaces required. It has the table that specifies number of spaces for the various land uses. And then a little bit farther down, it has specific provisions, including structures to be demolished or uh, replaced, masonry structures, and then H states compact parking spaces, a maximum of 30% of the required parking spaces for multifamily, commercial, and industrial uses. And my Zoom is looking at the lot. Ah, sorry. may be compact spaces. So that doesn't say that it has is required requires approval by the Planning Commission. It states a maximum of 30% of the required parking spaces for multifamily, commercial, and industrial uses may be compact spaces. I think overall, the original parking plan was approved by the Planning Commission. And so that's, I think, where the um, discretion for the commission to chime in comes in. But the code's pretty clear. Commissioner Barbos, did you wish to chime in? I do. Um, I, I have a somewhat different uh, take on this than than uh, the commissioners have been speaking about it. Have. And it, it's. I, I want to start with the the point that we, we, they're asking to restrike to put in ten more spaces. So somehow the request for trig for putting in more spaces as part of this has um, given rise to uh, a, a discussion about parking plans and and monitoring of the use of the parking at a time when the, when the hotel is is not has not yet reopened um, my view of this is that uh, I, I'm not really in favor of part having a requirement for a parking plan at this point. Um, I would like to see the requirements uh, for the use permit 
uh, give us the authority to require one in the future if a problem has been demonstrated uh, to uh, occur that needs correction by a parking plan. But I, I'm not inclined to sort of, in what is in my view, micromanage this at this point because of the, uh, they're, they're increasing the parking by 10. And as it has been pointed out, they, they have extra space as it is. So, um, I mean, I really thought that the bulk of this agenda item had to do with the generator, but it, the focus has, has been on the parking. And um, I, I just, I for one, just do not have uh, any interest in micromanaging the parking at this point. I would say that, um, if it's demonstrated to be a problem in the future that we should we can require a parking plan but other than that i i think in the uh, given the 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 economic climate the, the, and, and all that has gone with it i would just like to see this applicant be able to move forward with, the, with this at this point and if we need to we can tweak it later mr chair and, and, and as a follow-up to commissioner barbos and we kind of talked about it just a minute ago, a little while ago, we could have the applicant provide a report within six months to the director um, outlining the events of the parking situation um, for the director to then determine whether things are fine or whether it needs to be brought back, have that have the director myself, uh, whoever that may be, then make a decision as to whether it needs to be brought forward to the commission. That's another intermediary step rather than having them now report you know, before they can get approved, come up with a parking plan. That's another option for you. I would tend to, to, to support that kind of an idea because, well, to begin with, the, there is a demonstrated problem because there is still an off law street parking, realizing that there's been a lot of construction and everything going on. So some of that is enforced. But I, I would certainly favor us going ahead and approving uh, this this plan as it is, but then requiring them, uh, like you say, uh, David, to come back to the uh, planning director with a plan and making a decision to see if they have, if there's any problems that have arisen because of their parking situation. And then you can decide whether it has to come back to the commission or not. Question, question of uh, Michael. So if, for example, a condition says uh, the applicant shall be providing the planning director uh, a parking management status report within six months of the XYZ, are you getting a building permit, an occupancy permit that we can tie it to? Because I'm afraid that if we tie it to this date, you won't have a full six months of analysis to provide to me. Is there a, a, a date? So, that we, Or maybe we do nine months from today's date so we get six months of data. What are your, what are your permits that you're asking for? Uh, well, the next time you see us, we'll be before you with the renovation and expansion of the existing spa building. And um, that will be too soon. I think what's important to remember is Joe stated that they're estimating a, only a 35% occupancy uh, for the foreseeable future. So it's going to be difficult to provide you precise data on parking because staff counts will be down and guest counts will be down. So, um, but I certainly understand um, your desire to have a better understanding of how the overall parking may work in the future. What I would suggest is that um, we come back in maybe a year and um or if we come back with a project that has likely parking impacts that you ask us to uh, prepare something at that point i'm just worried about the validity of the data at this point because the occupancy is going to be so low because of the covid thing good point christina could you unshare your screen please oh you don't want to see the code anymore <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, are we at the point where somebody can make a motion or do you, go ahead? I comments. All right. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Wallander and then Kelso. I uh, want to uh, first state that I have, I take no exception right now to the banking 
of the 21 spaces. And I think that uh, that I can support. I would also like to preface by saying that I applaud the applicants significant investment in the landscape to the site to date. Um, unfortunately, most of the landscape that has been invested ha is pretty much like a private garden. So most of it is seen by those that stay there and not by the general public. Nonetheless, you have made an overall uh, good street frontage uh, appearance. I would like to throw out the idea of, again, because the tree removal is on the Broadway side uh, to get consideration about planting three new trees on stripe up against the fence, triangular like they do in many shopping centers where they can still slip a tree in. And I think that again would help the look of the west elevation. And along with that, I would also strongly encourage that the landscaping along Broadway be given a priority because we've discussed numerous times about the significance of this gateway intersection. And because of the way the site originally was developed, it just developed to be facing onto MacArthur and not Broadway. But nonetheless, a lot of, you know, Broadway is a significant elevation. So I would just uh, strongly support recognizing that and making sure that I'm not asking for a, um, a 12 foot solid screen, but I'm just simply saying, maintain a landscape that does not read a parking lot that parallels the majority of the frontage along Broadway. And those are my comments. Also? Yes. Um, I support everything um, Commissioner Wellander just said. I think screening from Broadway is important and I have noticed that it seems a little different recently. So everything he just said, I support. Um, with regard to the extra parking spaces, I wanna make it very clear that I support extra parking spaces. What I don't, what I'm not a huge fan of from the beginning is the valet parking program. I don't think it works at this site. I don't think it works in Sonoma. And I think, and I recognize it's a five-star property, but I just, it doesn't seem to really, it has not been executed well. Um, more to the point, a use permit obviously runs with the land. And so we all, we hear obviously that the current data is not gonna be great, possibly for a while, 35% occupancy, COVID, et cetera. But I'm, maybe I'm an optimist, but I believe that things are gonna come back at some point. I mean, if this is 35% occupancy indefinitely for this hotel, it's gonna go bankrupt. And so obviously I'm talking about a, a day when everything is back to normal. And so we have to make decisions, you know, with that in mind. And so I love the extra parking spaces. I'm all for that. I just want some sort of parking management program because I know a lot of people that live in the immediate neighborhood. I myself, quite frankly, go to MacArthur Place quite a bit or when it used to be opened. I love the bar at MacArthur. I, I just, I love the, the property. And I always see people, employees, parking on the street and walking in and out. I see it every time I'm there. And so in my personal anecdotal experience, it hasn't been working. And so whatever we can craft here that gives them the extra parking spaces, but also creates a parking program that actually works, that respects the neighborhood, and also allows the property to do what they want to do with it, I'm totally supportive of. I just haven't seen that happen yet. And so um, what I worry is in the future, this planning commission or a future planning commission is going to have a project for them that wants to add X number of hotel rooms or X number of this or X number of that and say, well, we have 20 extra spaces. And so no worries there when it hasn't actually been working. So if that point we have a parking management plan and everything's perfect, then I think those future planning commissions would have no problem approving that. That's all I'm saying, that I think I'm all for the extra spaces and I'm happy to support any motion tonight that approves those um, in addition to the foliage and the, the screening that Commissioner Wellander said. Um, I just think it's really important on this commission or on the planning director or on the applicant or on Michael Ross to come up with some parking management plan that works because I just think as I said in 2017, especially Sonomans, I mean, maybe some people don't, but, you know, valet parking, they just park on the street and walk in. And um, I think 
I think you have a certain percentage of people that when they come up to a 100% valet property, they're going to park on the street and walk in. And we have not accounted for that in our parking code. We do not have a valet section in our code that says if you have a 100% valet property, a certain percentage is probably going to park on the street. And so you have to account for it. I mean, we, we don't have that. And that's new to Sonoma. And so um, I don't know what the answer is there, but it hasn't been working. And I'm optimistic that it will in the future. And that's all I have to say. Just, uh, Mr. Chair, if I can, a suggestion then, assuming yeah. that that's the direction of the commission, perhaps. I, I mean, I've only heard from one on that particular point about a parking management plan. We could, uh, based on what Michael said, the applicant, we could require, because I'd hate to tie it to, to, to a time post COVID because we don't know when COVID is going to end. Maybe what we do is we say every six months from a certain date, from the date of this hearing, a report should be provided to the planning director who can then determine if indeed uh, a, a concern exists relative to the creation of a, a parking management plan to return to the commission. And then that way, if there is no issues because of the 30% post COVID, we can get to that point a year from now or six months after that. And then there is a problem on top of the issues that we've got as far as the expansion we just heard about, we could then have that resurface back to the commission. I'm fine with that. Given that input, is there anybody that is willing to try to craft a motion or are we not ready for that? Mr. Chair, you could say, uh, somebody could say a motion to be effective, uh, retaining the comments of Mr. Wallander and Mr. Storer, and we could have Christina write up a condition or we can do that and then return to this item later so that we're not kind of waiting while we craft. It's one of the awkward things with Zoom right now. Also, also I have no problem with the generator. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I make a motion that we approve this subject to the conditions of approval that staff noted with the addition of the comments by Commissioner Wellander and Director Storer. Is there a second? I'll second it. That was you, Larry? Yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Barbos. Yes. Commissioner Kelso Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Larry Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Bohar. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner Wellander. Yes. And Chair Felder. Yes. Thank you. The motion uh, passes uh, unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Hope we see a good report in six months. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, Mr. Chair, what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll tie up those conditions and provide those to the applicant uh, as part of our summary of tonight's action. And I um, did fast question. So I, I, I have a contract with the contractor. So I'm trying to set up the work um, in a week or two weeks uh, to begin this paving and striping before the hotel opens. Go for it. Joe, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get the question. Was there a question there? It was more of a Are comment. Are you building permits, Joe? Uh, well, we have an open site work permit. And again, we're sealing and striping and just adding a bit of paving per the fire marshal's request. Uh, I'd like to get it done before the hotel uh, opens. So it, how, how soon do we get the approval do we have oh, to approve right. 15 days for an appeal yeah the uh you do so at your own risk joe if you start tomorrow morning let's say but within three or four days we'll have the uh letter of the conditions of approval i don't know it takes some maybe a week i don't know christine will have to be uh, summarizing all of that and it over to you but you actually did get approval to do the work but again 15 days from appeal do so at your own risk okay i appreciate it. thank you Take a two minute break. Yes, we will break for two minutes. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. So, Wendy, during our break, are you going to uh, try to get us lined up?
Yes, I could hear it. It was faint. Okay. Uh, just a moment. and they're on small panels and i never got any of the graphics um if you go up to the upper right hand corner there is a, a box called speaker view versus gallery view. all i could see was six small panels and they keep shifting back and forth to different people depending on when they speak right. well go to the upper right hand corner do you see a, a, a box that either says speaker view or gallery view i'm sorry on the Mac. Let me, let me uh, cut down the sound because I've got people talking. I'm getting all kinds of feedback. Okay, go. Uh, now I've got six panels. I'm showing Larry and Ron, and then I'm sure. Do you do I'm, you have do you have a a what? box called gallery or speaker view? On no. the Mac, on this big screen. Do you want to talk to me, or do you want to talk to Chair Felder? Well, here, put yourself on mute, Jim. I'm I'm trying to. I can't find the mute. On your phone, I mean. Oh, sorry, no, 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 on the on the um, on the Zoom. <laughs> I uh, can only turn the volume down all the way. I I don't I don't have a mute. I can't. It's not showing. We might need a training session. Yes, I have the speaker. Jim, I'm on a Mac. Put your just hover your cursor. It's only the computer speaker. It and shows no controls to Zoom. Aimed at the Okay. It I, I, don't, I don't see any Zoom controls. And I don't, oh, wait a minute. Hit Zoom. Oh, here it is. So hit mute audio for Zoom. Jim, you just muted your, vo your voice. And I believe the shirt that are on the phone, can you please confirm? We are on the phone, Wendy, thank you. Okay, I'm going to mute you until the public hearing is open. Thank you. All right, thank you. Can we uh, proceed? Commissioner Bohar, you are muted right now, so we can't hear anything you're saying. Christina, are you talking to Jim? Yes, I am. Um, he's muted, so are you, is he trying to straighten it out or what? We can't. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to help him. I'm going to proceed, I think. Reopen the meeting. Thanks. There's a bunch of helicopters flying <laughs> over Sonoma. All right, we're going to move on to item 
8.2, which is the discussion possible action to approve a use permit and exception or variant applications of Tom and Renee Sherstad for the following. A use permit to offer authorize an overhead wood fence and retaining wall exception or variance to the fence height standards to authorize an over height wood fence and retaining wall, both located at 1040 Berryessa Court. With that, I will go to a staff report from Wendy Atkins, please. Thank you, Chair Felder and members of the commission. Um, some of you may recall that this uh, project was before you a few months ago. Uh, this um, project came about because of a code enforcement issue. And as a result of that, in uh, November of last year, a use permit application was submitted. Back in February, the Planning uh, Commission considered the retaining wall and over high wood fence and continued the review of the project to allow the applicants to uh, revise the proposal and reach out to the neighbors. The property consists of a corner lot with a front yard area located along Berryessa Court and a street yard area located on Berryessa Drive. The existing wood fence has two segments, one approximately 63 feet in length, running north to south, set back seven and a half feet from the street side property. And the second um, segment is approximately 64 feet in length, running east to west set back seven and a half feet from the front property line. And the existing retaining wall is three feet, four inches tall, and the fence is, the fence is three and a half feet tall. Here are some pictures of the existing conditions on the property. At this time, the applicant is proposing three options for this commission to review and consider. Option one is to maintain the current wood railing cap, keep the 17 inches of five and a half inch boards with half inch spacing, and then the above space, 21 and a half inches, would include two two and a half inch boards. Option two is to lower the fence to 28 and a half inches with three five and a half inch boards with half inch spacing and two one and two and a half inch boards with six inch spacing. And finally, option three is to lower the fence to a height of 17 inches with three five and a half inch boards with half inch spacing between. So there were some inconsistencies with the general plan as proposed. Um, and these relate to uh, circulation elements. With regard to the development code requirements, the fence heights are limited to three and a half feet in the 20 foot front and street side yard setback area. In addition, um, at intersections, the height of, a f of the fence is limited to 30 inches. And the retaining wall is not consistent with the fence height requirements in that it is taller than 30 inches at the intersection area. With regard to the discussion of project issues, the public works director and city engineer stated um, that she can't support a retaining wall or a fence height taller than three and a half feet because the project is located in an intersection and it, and it obstructs sightline issues. She notes that the Madeira Park Trail ends and enters the roadway on Broadway and this existing condition confirms the need for the retaining wall and fence to comply comply with the three and a half foot height requirements. The applicants did reach out to the neighbors since the last meeting, and they had made attempts to speak to the neighbors and received letters of both support and opposition. And those letters are on the um, city's website in the document folder. Uh, the staff's recommending that the planning commission approve an exception to the fence height standards and require the existing wood fence be removed in the intersection safety site area and the wood fence in the front and the street side setback areas shall be reduced to not exceed a height of 13 inches and so um, i have 
um, made some marks on these plans to try to indicate uh, what staff is on trying to propose. So in this picture, um, we would allow the retaining wall to remain and then the, um, the fence portion above the retaining wall could extend to uh, 13 inches and then everything above 13 inches would be removed. And in the traffic line of sight area, the entire element of the fence would be removed. And then uh, going up towards the house, the retaining wall would remain 13 inches of fence and then everything above that would be removed. And staff's, oh, that's, um, sorry about that. That's staff's recommendation. And that concludes staff's report. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, questions of staff? Go ahead, Steve. In, in the safety site area where uh, you are proposing that all fencing be removed, uh, Wendy, is would there be a prohibition against landscaping in that area that would provide some shielding of the yard? Well, you could have landscaping, but we wouldn't want anything that would take the form of a hedge. And that was included as um, one of the conditions of approval. Yeah, it's condition 1E. Yeah, it says solid screen landscaping shall be permitted, prohibited. What was that term again? Prohibited. No, no, the what kind of landscaping is prohibited? Solid screen landscaping. Oh, okay. And that applies for not only the site area, but the entire length, doesn't it? Yes. Any other questions of staff? Yes. Go ahead, Ron. Um, Wendy, on just to make sure I understand, on the applicants option three that they proposed, the drawing suggests that the top cap is to remain. That's is, my understanding, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of staff? Same kind of question. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, excuse me, I was having a little trouble on hearing that the last time. You're suggesting that the everything above the retaining wall be removed, whether it's in the front or the side, is that what I understood? Only in that traffic line of sight area, the remaining portions of the fence in this section uh, would be limited to, the fence height would be limited to 13 inches. So they'd have the retaining wall and then 13 inches of height and the same on the street side setback. So what was the basis for that? Was that a, just a, a general concession that you thought might work? What was the basis for the 13? Oh, sure. Anything above any height of fence above 13 inches would require approval of a variance. And those variance findings are extremely difficult to make. And so um, we're recommending just the Planning Commission approve an exception. Well, let me go back to when the grading, per well, if it had a grading permit and it had a permit to build a retaining wall, isn't the retaining wall have a, a in the regulations, a limit of 30 inches? No. Only in that line of sight area, a fence or a wall is limited to 30 inches, but a retaining wall can be taller than that. Okay, what if it were a fence in that area, not a retaining wall? In the, the, the intersection line of sight area, the maximum height is 30 inches. Okay, but they, so they could have it higher than 30 inches if it was out of the pedestrian traffic line of sight area. Is that what you're saying? Right, and they could have it as high as three feet, four inches, which is proposed in this proposal with an exception. The, um, the retaining wall is three feet, four inches. Correct. And to legalize that, it requires an exception. But in your suggestion, nothing would be above three feet, four inches. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. 
So there's no fencing above the retaining wall? Just in that safety line of sight area that I um, drew on this site plan, you can see this pink triangle. So in this area, the height of the retaining wall would be three feet, four inches, and there would be no fence allowed on top of it. Okay, I don't have the benefit of any graphics. My computer's not working right, but oh, it's, it's, in the, it's, it's in the packet in what in the drawing in the back. Okay, that's fine. Um, oh, uh, regarding the uh, occlusion of the retaining wall, there could be dense landscaping in front of the retaining wall around the entire perimeter of it. Is that correct? Yes, provided it doesn't exceed a height of three and a half feet. It could be, well, so it could be the same height as the uh, retaining wall, have to be trimmed to that point if it grew, huh? Yes. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Application on that one. Are you saying an additional three and a half feet above the retaining wall? No. No, no any dense vegetation would be limited to the height of the retaining wall and any additional fence element. All right. So I have a question to ask of you on, on, on the, uh, what you're recommending uh, that we approve. Uh, you recommend only the 13 inch fence portion in out, outside of the, uh, the site area, but wouldn't that uh, require them to remove the, the posts uh, uh, above the 13 inches? Yes. And their, their option three does not remove those posts. Let's take a look at that plan. The post and cap are, remain in their right. option. Yep, you're right. And secondly, uh, you have a condition about solid screen landscaping. There has now been landscaping installed between the retaining wall and the existing fence. And uh, upon my inspection, and I would like to have uh, Commissioner Wellender chime in on this, it would appear that the landscaping that has been put in would provide a solid screen landscaping. Do you have any opinion on that? Um, yes, I can comment on that. The uh, the plant material that currently is there on site, at the bottom of the retaining wall, there's a grass called Lamandria, which a Lamandra, which will not get very tall at all. Above the retaining wall, between the retaining wall and the existing fence, there are four different types of plants. Um, you have something called uh, Petosporum tenufolium, and that has the potential, if you just in some settings, can grow up to be eight. 10 feet tall. It can be managed, it can be trimmed. They also have a grass called Miscanthus morning light, which can get to about, oh, about three foot plus height of the actual uh, plumes. So it could be a little bit taller. And then they have verbena and uh, some uh, lavender, which we're all familiar with. So it's a mix of plants. The planting of the Potosporum tenifolia is rather tight. It potentially could become an attractive large hedge, if not really managed. Uh, so that's my input as far as the existing plant material. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? I, I have one quick question. Okay, Wendy, could you take the uh, share screen right. off so I can see the rest of the commission? Certainly. Thank you. So Mike, just a quick question. So Wendy, your recommendation to allow the 13 inches of fence above the retaining wall is based just on what the code allows without granting a variance? Correct. And so this has nothing to do with like aesthetics or does it even make sense to have a little 13 inch fence? It, it just has to do what is the maximum allowed? Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? 
Seeing none, I'm going to go out to the applicant. Okay, the shirt studs are now unmuted. Hello. Okay. Are we able to speak then? Yes, you are. it's your turn. Okay, thank you for hearing our item in February. We believe that intent, our true intentions are very important. As we upgraded the interior of our house and exterior landscaping, we believe we could use our front yard space, put seating there and enjoy a yard like all of our neighbors do, as they have huge backyards and we do not. We live very close to a dog and kids park and walking path and wanted to protect our new landscaping and furniture. We believe we were following the city guidelines and requirements. However, it seems there is substantial room for misinterpretation. We were trying to create usable outdoor living space, correct extremely poor drainage issues across the sidewalk, and even out the space a bit so we could place outdoor seating. We have numerous signatures from our neighbors and letters on very at the court, Lakita and Evans, who have physically walked by and stood in front of our fence and verbally approved of our retaining wall and fence as it is at its current height. In addition, the city has received a number of letters, eight to 10, written by the neighbors close by, endorsing our wall, fence, and landscaping. We hope you had an opportunity to read them. Does what the other numerous neighbors think matter at all to the planning commission? It seems there are two complainers who want to dictate to the commission as to how they should proceed. Why didn't they come to us when it was first being built? Never once did they voice any concerns. They, like others in Sonoma, came from another city, bought their homes with huge backyards, and seemed to have a vendetta against us for wanting to use our front yard, as ours is dark and extremely narrow. By the way, neither one of them directly view our fence from their homes. We tried in writing to negotiate with the neighbors who originally complained by lowering the height of the fence, creating a more open design. He hasn't spoken to us in person, but wrote back a negative comment. This process feels very discriminating to us as so many other corner homes in the city have surrounding fences similar to ours, some much, much higher, which are actually built right on the sidewalk edges. With that said, we're asking for approval to keep part of the fence under these conditions. Lower the fence to a height of only 17 inches. When Wendy was here, we talked about 17 inches and she seemed agreeable to be to that. She never mentioned 13 or variance. This leaves only three five inch boards with half inch or more space in between them. This will leave very little fencing that is currently two feet behind the retaining wall planter box for the plants that you mentioned existing to grow up against. Pedestrian will easily be able to see over and through it. We would like to continue this graduation towards the entry as well as the street side yard setback area to the house at the end of the retaining wall to deter dogs from entering and doing their business in our newly landscaped area. We are asking for approval of the above conditions. And, by, and also uh, the plan on maintaining plants we intend to do, unlike many of the neighbors who have 10 to 12 foot hedges nearby. Is that, uh, have you concluded Renee? Is yes, that? I have. And now Tom would like to say a few words. Okay, thank you. I, uh, you know, my, my comment is that uh, why does the planning department continue to bring up the site distance issue? You know, at our meeting in February, uh, two commissioners stated that they had come to the property, visited, and said there was no site distance issues. And, and now the planning department is using a highway design manual for their reference. Uh, this is... Uh, this, this doesn't make any sense because the Berryessa Court is about a little over 100 feet long. There's three homes on Berryessa Court. And if you left, I mean, if you read what they said in their, in their uh, uh, report, they're concerned about cars coming out of Berryessa Court at 10, 15 miles an hour. If you can get up at five miles an hour leaving Berryessa Court, you're doing well. Uh, in my work in the past, I worked for the Washington State Patrol, and I'm currently working for the California Highway Patrol. 
and I've been involved in a lot of site distance accident reviews, and this this is not an issue in this uh, area. The streets that intersect Barry uh Drive are Evans and La Quinta. Both have sharp turns entering Barry Essa Drive, and the speeds don't exceed 10 miles an hour. Pedestrians use the sidewalk. Bikes use the street. I've never seen a state skateboard uh, ever. People coming in and out of the bike path stay to the left, and, and they'll never have a visible issues, visibility issues, excuse me. Finally, uh, you know, Barry Essa Drive is a 36-foot wide street with 100% visibility, and I don't know why planning is continuing to use this site distance issue because it's not an issue on this street. That's all I've got. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for the applicant? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. I'll open up the public hearing for other public comment. Do we have anybody that's uh, called in or connected? Yes. Um, Martin Weil can speak now. Oh, good evening. Uh, commission members, Wendy, Atkins, Shurstads. I don't know if you can see me. If you can, I apologize. I didn't know I was going to be on the screen. I would have shaved if I knew. Um, I'm Martin Weil. I live at 1040 Barry S. Drive. My wife and I have lived here since 2012. And I'm one of the neighbors who initially brought the issue to the attention of the city. But I'm speaking here for myself only. And I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I did submit a letter to staff earlier this week for the commission as part of this discussion, and I'll try to be very brief here. Uh, my concerns about the project all along as built were noted and echoed by the members of the commission at your February meeting. Uh, various members commented uh, that the wall and the fence inappropriately surround most of the property and that the combination of the wall and the fence is of a size, height, and scope that's wholly out of character with the neighborhood. You know, I, I am really sorry that the Shurstads and I have not been able to discuss this matter as neighbors. I did have one interaction with them after the February meeting, and I frankly didn't find it encouraging uh, to try to reach out to them again. Uh, I apologize for that. Perhaps I should have. Um, Prior to the May meeting, I did receive a certified letter from them. Uh, it stated their plans. It didn't. It wasn't an offer to discuss or meet or talk. And so I wrote a letter in response that said I didn't agree with it. I'll note that I have a very small backyard. Uh, my house, the front. In fact, at, the very, at this very moment, I'm looking at the wall and fence out of my front window. And I'll note that all of the homes in this neighborhood have relatively small backyards. So I'm not a trained professional, but as I read the variations they have proposed, one, two, and three, they all retain 120 feet of surround fencing. And while I kind of have trouble reading the drawings, because as again, I don't read these things very well, it appears that they all retain a fence element that has a combined height with the wall of seven feet. Now, I don't understand the rules exactly around height regulations, but it seems the staff's recommendation this evening does bring the fortress-like aspect of uh, the wall and the fence down to one that fits better in the neighborhood, and I won't object to that. And I do actually support granting an exception for the variant retaining wall, uh, which with the recent addition of landscaping is a nice addition to the property. But it should have the provision that appropriate permits are obtained uh, for the construction and for the fill behind it. So I'm sure this is not the first time and it won't be the last that a property owner has fled a, fled a special case to create a precedent to undermine the openness of Sonoma that these very regulations were written to preserve. This is not really a personal matter. This is about the neighborhood and the kind of town that this is. Uh, Sonoma steadfastly guarded the small town character. And I'll skip the rest of it, blah, 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 blah. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your consideration. You probably don't like being in the middle of a neighbor dispute. I hope you 
don't see it this way. I see it as an issue about the character and the rules that were set up to preserve the character of the town. Thanks again. Thank you, Martin. Are there any other people from the public? Here, I can't hear you, Wendy. I think she's yes. Muted. Yes, we have uh, one additional uh, comment from the public, uh, from Pat Pat Patricia McDonald, and she can speak now. Go ahead, Patricia. Thank you very much. You know, this is not something that we're really happy about having to dis dispute something with our neighbors. It's been such a lovely neighborhood of people getting along. And unfortunately, the first time that I met um, my new neighbor was when they were cutting down this beautiful tree that my friend the owl had lived in. And she came over to, to just let me know the noise was happening because of the tree. And I mentioned to her that I wish she had talked to us before about some of the changes that they're making. But she implied that that was really not, not necessary, that we could call the city if we had any questions about the kinds of changes that they were proposing. So I just, I just bristled a little bit when she mentioned that we were uh, people with a vendetta who come in from outside. By the way, my husband moved here in 1965. So I don't think he's really considered an outsider. We are the neighbors. Um, I'm, I'm just really sorry that this is appearing to be an, a, a neighborhood squabble because it's been such a lovely neighborhood. It's open. We're on the corner. We like that openness. Um, many people who buy a corner house do like that. And obviously some of the problems that uh, our neighbor is concerned about were existing in the house that they purchased, but that was their choice. They're the ones who brought in the landfill and necessitated having the, um, the retaining wall. And I think the retaining wall is just fine. It's the upper fence that makes you feel like you're all closed in when you are walking around there. So those are just my comments. And I, I am I'm concerned about the, the height of the wall. I'm also concerned about what this does to our neighborhood. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Patricia. We have anyone else or any emails? No additional um, verbal comments and no emails. Okay, uh, with that then I, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion, possible action. I a, yeah, I just have a quick question or comment. Um, uh, the applicant said that he doesn't understand why planning keeps pushing this um, you know, site situation um i just want to verify with wendy that's not planning right that's public works that's a that's that's not coming from the planning department that's coming from another department am i correct well the the fence height regulations state that at intersections the height of a fence or a wall is limited to 30 inches and um the public works director has said that she'd be willing to allow a three foot four inch height in that area, that that would not obstruct traffic as far as she's concerned. But anything else she would have a problem with? Unless it's op unless any additional fence height on top of the retaining wall, she would like to see 75% open. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes? Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Well, I, uh, I had an opportunity to walk out and explore the site. And uh, uh, I understand that the uh, property owners um, have some preferences. But as I stated at the last meeting, the, uh, to me, the uh, purpose of our code regulations regarding fence heights even going beyond the issue of traffic safety has to do with a sense of openness and not walling off houses from the street. And as far as I'm concerned, this current retaining wall and fence combination does exactly that. It walls off the house from the street. I heard someone use the word fortress. It creates a fortress-like quality that I find 
not at all becoming. Um, in so far as the uh, use of the property is concerned, uh, from what I can tell, uh, the, the backyard, um, though I guess some might call it small, um, is large enough to contain a swimming pool and uh, as seating areas. Uh, and uh, there's been no mention of the use of that backyard for a swimming pool at all in any of this discussion. And yet there it is. Um, that's a choice that the applicant made as to the use of the rear property. Uh, furthermore, the area next to the house is being used as a, a petanque or bocce ball court. It's a substantial space, about 11 feet by probably 20. Uh, once again, uh, this is a matter of choice. Uh, so I think that there have certainly been options available to this property owner as to the use of the space, and they have made a, a series of decisions. I continue to find the wall, the fence above the wall to be objectionable. I am prepared to accept the um, uh, retaining wall as a feature, even though it is uh, right at the edge of being too high but I'm prepared to accept the retention of that retaining wall. But uh, in my opinion, the balance of the fencing above the retaining wall, in part due to the complexity of a variance, um, is in my opinion, something should, that should be removed. And I'm prepared to make a motion to that effect uh, when it's appropriate. Thank you. Anyone else? I have a question. Go ahead, Sheila. I was trying to do the polite thing and raise my hand, but I guess that doesn't work. The virtual no, I, I hand. Have, I have it on the side here, and I do see it now, but <laughs> I also <laughs> can do the visual. So you, you're okay. in. So uh, my question is for Wendy. Um, I, I want to just go back to the comment uh, that the applicants made about um, um, misinformation. And I do realize that they were using an out of area landscape architect. And Wendy, could you just provide us with any background or comments on what you know about that part of the process and what, if anything, went wrong there? Well, I did have a number of conversations with the applicant at the front counter when the front counter was still open. And uh, I remember a lot of the conversations were about a pool that they wanted to put in the front yard and associated uh, fencing with that regard. So we had some conversations about fencing um, around a pool and that it would require a variance because a six foot tall fence is required around a pool. Um, I, honestly, I, I can't recall having any specific conversations with their landscaper, but honestly, I talked to um, a lot of people about fences all the time and they may not have identified themselves as representing the applicants. Okay, thank you. And then for the follow up on that for the pool, the the permit that was issued for putting the pool in and a subsequent fence appropriate for the pool. Tell us about that step of the process. Sure. So when I was talking with the applicants, they were wanting to put the pool in the front yard. They they changed their plans and they put the pool in the backyard and they have the appropriate tall fence in their backyard. So um, I need some help answering your question. Oh, and in that case, it was made clear to them that they um, need to have the six foot fencing around the pool area. And there was no further discussion at that point about uh, larger fencing around the rest of the front of the yard? Not that I can recall, no. Okay, all right, thank you. Right. Just a bit, Commissioner Wellander, did you have your hand up? You're muted. I know. Now I'm not. I uh, I too had a chance to go back to the site and revisit it, kind of inventory the few minor landscaping changes that have taken place relative to plant materials since the last time we brought this project up. <clears throat> and I don't uh, particularly like 
the idea of the staff's recommendation because I think it's going to render it looking very odd. And I understand that that recommendation is driven purely by code. I look at the three options that have been generated by the applicant and the uh, option number three, if it's built the way it has been drafted, keeping the post in the rail will suggest that something's missing. And I don't think that's a good alternative. And then the other two options um, could have some merit, but what I really came away with and what I'm going to throw out for discussion on the table is uh, much like my previous commissioner, uh, Mr. Barnett, I, I also support the retaining wall. I think if we're quibbling over four inches and the engineer has said there's not a sideline issue, we're okay with that, that I could live with that retaining wall, recognizing that the landscape at some point is going to grow and soften it and it will not look quite as prominent. The, um, I also recognize and understand the applicant's desire to use outdoor space. And certainly, I believe I said last time that uh, our outdoor space in our little community is very valuable. <clears throat> I, I would support uh, with some degree of uh, being rather naive about what we're going to have to do in terms of a variance, but I would support the idea of leaving the existing fence simply on the side street as it's built to just to the point where we have that sight line triangle and no further. From that point all the way around, I say I, I would not support seeing anything in terms of uh, a 13 inch fence or anything like that. In looking at the plan, looking at the site plan, <clears throat> and looking at the overall space on that corner, one of the one of the beauty, beauties of a corner lot is the fact that it does oftentimes capture quite a bit of space. I still believe the applicant has an opportunity to use that front space in a very uh, good way, but it could be developed, in my opinion, uh, much more effectively and within our concerns with landscaping rather than a fence. And there are opportunities to break up that space. You could do some screens that are set back beyond the setback, so to speak. And so I'll just kind of wrap up my comment. I drove up and down the street and I looked at that side fence. May not have been my first choice, but I also think that you know, that, um, that sense of privacy at that end, I could live with. Having it wrap around the front, having it go all the way to the front entrance walk, to me, creates that, that, that image of shielding off, turning your back to the neighborhood. So I would not, like I said, I would not support. So I'm recommending that <clears throat> keep the retaining wall, keep the, uh, the, the existing fence along the side just to that triangular point that has been identified on attachment A, which is approximately exactly to the alignment of the further, furthermost wall section to their house. And then um, not approve any other stuff in terms of a, a built wooden fence within the setback around to the front. And those are my comments. Mr. Bohar. I uh, have a question for Wendy. Wendy, is it my, it's my understanding that anything above the three foot, four inch uh, retaining wall would require an exception. Is that true? And beyond yes. one inch, I think you made a comment to me. Right. So, um, Anything above three foot four inches is either going to require a variance or an exception. Okay. The height of 13 inches would require an exception. Anything taller than that would be a variance. Mm -hmm. I okay. I've been down to the site a couple of times, um, and I've read the I read the correspondence. Uh, it's my opinion that this uh, retaining wall is really dominant and industrial looking and inappropriate for this residential neighborhood. 
and I don't think it's in keeping with the the uh, landscaping culture of front yards in this town. It's 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 very bulky and dominant. I don't see that there's a rationale here uh, provided by the applicant or by other information that that should allow any exception and certainly not a, 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 to go so far as a variance. I, I would be in favor of uh, re keeping the retaining wall as is, but insisting on uh, dense foliage, uh, no more landscaping except foliage that's dense to, enough to include occlude the uh, retaining wall, something like a boxwood hedge and large enough plants where they would be effective in the next six to 12 months. Maybe Commissioner Wellander is interested in commenting on that, what would be appropriate to occlude it like a boxwood that would completely uh, hide it, which is what I'd like to do. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to make a, an observation. Some of you may have seen this article a couple of days in the Wall Street Journal. It's about uh, residential landscaping. It's entitled, America is Rediscovering the Social Front Yard. And I'll read just two lines out of this. For decades, we burrowed into the privacy of our back gardens. Now sheltering in place has us moving those patio chairs up front so we can snatch a moment of human communication. Bear with me, one more sentence. LA landscape designer Kathleen Ferguson recalls creating a front space for his family in Studio City. We started the project a couple of years ago. The client specifically mentioned they wanted to, it kept open and accessible to the neighbors because their street had a real community feel. So in my view, there's an opportunity here. And I spend a lot of time on my front porch on First Street West talking to the neighbors as they walk by. Thank you. Who's next? I'll go. Okay. Um, I really liked what Commissioner Bohar just said. I think that um, uh, that spirit has been part of our general code and part of our development code. As uh, Commissioner Larry Barnett has said, Sonoma is not a walled off community. Um, I think that uh, one of the uh, public commenters apologized for, for us having to sort of settle a neighborhood dispute. And, um, and I don't think an apology is necessary. That's just sort of what we have to do here. And so when we're not really sure what to do, I think what we need to do is look at the code. Um, the code is there. The code was, has not changed since this property was purchased two years ago. Um, and the code is not just for the property owners to do what they want to do with their property. It's also for the neighbors to protect the neighbors from what the property owners want to do with their property sort of that's the whole point of a development code. And so um, with that spirit, I think that um, I support, well, I don't entirely support staff's recommendation. I support staff's recommendation, the spirit of it in the sense that they um, outline what it, the maximum that is allowed. I just personally think a 13 inch fence um, is ridiculous. And so I would support personally maintaining the retaining wall and um, and um, removing the fence and the sight lines as, as uh, described in the staff report. Um, I'm open, I'm sort of open to what Commissioner Wellander said about the side yard, a full fence there, um, because those, those side yard fences do exist um, in other areas of town, even in this immediate area with, by the way, removing all fencing in, in the front yard setback. Um, the only issue I have with that is, as uh, Wendy described, it is much harder to make findings for a variance. And um, I don't know if we have, I mean, I, I haven't looked at the findings yet, but I don't know if we could even make those findings. And so perhaps that's further discussion on that. But in general, I would be okay with maintaining the retaining wall as it is and removing um, really actually all the fencing, because I, I, I just personally don't think um, a 13 inch fence is is um, aesthetically pleasing or necessary. Anyone else? No, you're that tall. Um, I'd like to. Okay, go ahead, Sheila. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
we're kind of a little bit all on the same thinking here, but there's some variances here. And um, I'd like to um, thank all the neighbors who commented and all the neighbors who are willing to write in, though both in favor and, and those not in favor. I, I think that means a lot. It means an awful lot. And we all know the old quote, good fences make good neighbors, um, but this isn't a good fence. And so it's created some problems. Not only does it not meet code, but it wasn't done with the neighbors uh, understanding and communication. Um, I'm similarly thinking that the retaining wall, while it was built too large and was uh, not appropriate, I would be okay with keeping that but I would like to have all the fencing removed and to allow some foliage that did not grow in as a screened opaque hedge. So I would be okay with keeping the retaining wall, but not having any fencing. Um, not only is a 13 um, inch fence odd, but it seems to me like a trip hazard. <laughs> Somebody trips off that fence, goes right over the retaining wall and out onto the sidewalk. So I'd rather not see a fence there at all. Um, I do understand the need to have more yard space, but I'll repeat what I said last time. The house is the house you bought. It came with the yard it came with. What you've done was clever. Um, I appreciate that, but you didn't buy a house with a big giant yard. So um, you're doing the best of what you can, but you do have to work within the parameters of our code and within the good graces of your neighbors. So I'm gonna be in favor of something that gets rid of all the fencing altogether and keeps the retaining wall. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Steve? I, I agree with the uh, position Sheila just articulated and, and I'd just like to offer one uh, comment uh, to the Shearstads, which hopefully will make some sense. Uh, you can look around town and find many, many um, fences that don't meet the standards that you're being held to. But um, like speed limits, there are many people that violate them. And if you get pulled over for going over the speed limit, you it's not a defense to say, but these other cars were going fast too. And that's kind of what we have here. I mean, these other fences that have been, that exist, in some cases may uh, predate the, the existing uh, regulations. And if they don't, this is a complaint driven situation. So only if somebody raises an issue, does, does the city take a look at it and they don't have the resources to drive around town and and red tag every fence that is not in compliance when it may actually, as I said, it may predate the uh, regulation. So I, I too am in favor of allowing the retaining wall to remain. I guess we need an exception for that because I think it's one inch over. Uh, and, and I really think the yard would be much more attractive if some money was invested in a really good landscape plan because you can create a very nice area with some private space for sitting in your front yard with um with some nice landscaping so that's that's those are my comments all right yeah mr chair i'd like to make a motion uh i, I move I first i'm sorry yeah i have my turn first oh yeah of course thank you um uh, I would like to, to say I agree with most of the comments that were just issued about keeping the wall but removing the fence, but I have another concern. Uh, the shrubbery, the landscaping that's been put in there, it has the ability to create a fence of its own. Uh, and one of the conditions that was in our uh, packet was that it could not be a solid screen of landscape uh, uh, as well as the fence and especially with the uh, uh, the sight line uh, the traffic sight line area uh, I would like to, if we craft a motion uh, with the majority of this commission that we also include something that uh, restricts the uh, the type of landscaping that's put 
in right behind that retaining wall because otherwise it's going to become, it could have the ability to become a solid eight foot uh, barrier, which is no different than if the fence were there. So well, that's what I have. So go ahead, Larry. Okay. Uh, well, then I would make a motion to um, uh, allow for an exception for the retaining wall uh, that the additional fencing that has been constructed on the perimeter of the site above the retaining wall be entirely removed, that landscaping, which is um, provided in association with the frontage of the property, not uh, be of the type that obstructs a uh, line of sight and creates a uh, visual impediment to uh, safety uh, comparable to that of a solid fence. And I think that incorporates uh, everything that we've talked about. Thank you. Anyone care to second that? I have a, I have a comment, please. Okay, go ahead. It has to be I'll seconded wait, wait first. A second. Do we uh, have a second, first of all? We have a motion on the floor. I'll second it. Okay, go ahead, Jim. You can have a comment. Excuse me. Uh, Commissioner Barnett, would you, are, are, there, are you and other commissioners willing to add the occluding type of hedge at the starting at the base of the retaining wall and traveling up to the top of the retaining wall to occlude that massive thing? No, I'm not going to include that in the motion. I think that uh, that uh, the acceptance of the retaining wall is is exactly that. It's the acceptance of the of the retaining wall. My hope, because you can <laughs> see that plants have already been planted in front of that retaining wall. My hope is that there is a sensitive landscape plan that will soften the effect of that retaining wall. If I lived there, that's what I would want to do, but I but I'm not prepared to make that in a a, a part of the motion. Okay, just another comment. I'm, I took some pictures out there. I from the middle of the street to the retaining wall. Um, there's almost no vegetation visible at the base of that retaining wall, and it's there's there's, like, there's nothing planted there. I don't see that it's going to be in any way softened or shielded. You're talking about you're perhaps talking about the landscaping in front of the fence, which is above the wall. No, well, that, that's not I may correct. Be, I, I may be confusing the two, but I recall some planting at the base of the retaining of the retaining wall. It looks like Mr. Wellander has a comment. If I send a picture, could it be revealed it, or not? No. Go ahead, Ron. No, um, Commissioner Bohar, you're you're not correct. Uh, there is, as I mentioned when I gave the inventory of existing plants, Lomandra, L-O-M-A-N-D-R-O or R-A, is a grass slide that has been planted and it's, they planted it one gallon cans, they're not big, has the potential to get about 18 inches, probably maybe a little bit more, and it's there and it will, uh, it I'm sure was intended to quote soften, but also that if they maintain the verbena, which is down along Berryessa Drive, close to the neighbor's property line, that is a ground cover that can easily spill on over and down and also contribute to softening. And the other thing, just to keep in mind, which may be obvious, may not be, but you know, because of the newness of the uh, retaining wall, it's kind of slaps you in the face, but you drive around town and look at most wood, outdoor wood, facility structures, what have you, they tend to, if they're not stained and painted, they tend to soften uh, in time. But I did want to make an additional comment, which while the motion is on the table, and that is, again, um, I, I, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Barbosa's uh, comments about, about um, existing conditions. And Going back to my recommendation, at least my comments were based upon what I felt was, yes, a compromise. Yes, I'm not totally clear on 
what we would take for Wendy to write up a draft for a variance, but I would uh, just politely suggest that that short section of fence that would give a greater immediate sense of privacy along the <laughs> side of the house in the estimation, in my own estimation, does not create a fortress. And that's, I won't beat a dead horse and say it a third time, but I just wanted to reiterate the, the madness behind my earlier comments. Council? Yeah, um, two things. One, Commissioner Bohar, when did you take that picture? Let, let me show you this picture. When did you take it? I took it three days ago. Okay. Um, okay. It's, you got it. Can't see a thing. <laughs> Just a minute. I'm. I, it's on my cell phone, so it's not exactly a masterpiece. There it is. Added, there's a chance they've added planting in the past three days. Okay. Do you see that? I don't see any landscaping in the front. Sorry. I know, but I, I feel I went by it today, and I thought there was, and so sure. I'm. Well, you see the base. There's a couple scraggly trees, but I don't see anything there. It's there. I see it. There's little tiny grasses. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I don't see anything there, right? I still think I, I still think that's massive and dominant and it ought to be softened. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Well, I, I just wanted to follow up on Commissioner Wellander's question to Wendy. What kind of findings would you have to make for a variance? I mean, you said they're much more difficult in how how much more difficult? Well, let me um, show you what they are here. I can. Well, well, Wendy brings that up. I'll give you a couple of them off the top of my head. Yeah. First one is you can't be granting a special privilege to somebody else that's not already enjoying that privilege. There has to be physical site constraints that are unique to the property. This would be a case of retrofitting an issue to make it unique to that property. And uh, you can always modify the code as opposed to making an exception. And, State law has specific findings, and we've adopted those within our mini code. They've been there for years. Can you find those, Wendy? Yeah, yeah they're yeah, on they the, the screen. Okay. See, there's a special circumstances provision there, number two, that it's something unique to the shape, the topo, the location or surroundings, and that we're depriving uh, the applicant of a benefit that others are enjoying within the vicinity in the same zoning district. Uh, the adjustment does not constitute a grant of special privileges. That's the, the fourth one. And so then you've also got your basic public health and safety things that granting the variance will overcome those kind of things or, or not be causing those things. And it's a, a much higher standard than the exception that's been built into the code. We as staff have, have, meant, have talked about this. We don't think those findings can be made, but if there's direction from the commission, We'd like to have your commission provide that information to us so that we can write it in, into the record. Would staff have recommended a variance if they thought the findings could be granted? We would have done, but we I can't. Would. Yeah. Okay. So you don't. Okay. And the other thing is, um, I mean, obviously the yeah. they have the right to enjoy uh, certain elements of their property that neighbors do. That would just be, I mean, that's part of the variance findings. That would be up to us to sort of determine that. Right. Yeah, and we and we would need you to, to demonstrate to us how that is so that these findings can be made in the affirmative. Commissioner Wellander, is your hand up yet or did you just No, I, it, it was it was back up. The, what what again, I didn't I didn't write those uh, necessary findings or requirements, but uh, special conditions you know, it, it is a corner house. It's not, it's not a uh, infill lot. Uh, there is an existing condition within a stone's throw, where again it it was either granted, ignored, nobody complained about it, that created privacy in a side yard that in today's code is just screaming with violation. So I just find it difficult to look at things in black and white. 
I, I just see gray in this application. I'd like to call the question, Mr. Chair. Uh, Wendy, can you, uh, thank you. <laughs> she already knows you're gonna ask that, Chair. <laughs> I know, I like to see everybody's face. Uh, we have a call of a question. We, uh, is there any further discussion? I don't think there is. Uh, would you take it a roll like call? She, it looks like Sheila has her hand up. Oh. I do. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I just want to follow up on uh, Commissioner Wellander's comment. Um, and it, this came up during our last meeting with regards to the fence that is actually included in the packet here that they built uh, without getting appropriate permission to do it. One of the things that we have to be careful is not making decisions on new projects based on projects that went forward that were not within code. And so if somebody built a fence nearby and it was previously done and it doesn't meet code, we can't just continue to ignore it and allow a new project to also ignore the code. So I'm just going to toss that out there that uh, two wrongs don't make a right. Yeah, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote on the motion on the floor. Could you repeat the motion, please? To retain the retaining wall and grant the exception for its height. To remove the uh, wooden fencing above the retaining wall in its entirety. And to uh, require that any... Uh, uh, any landscaping material that's planted above the retaining wall does not create the same kind of solid barrier to, of site that a, a, a fence would create. Thank you. Okay. Can we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Barbos. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Kelso Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Larry Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Bohar. Yes. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner Wellander. No. Chair Felder. Yes. Thank you. The motion passes six to one. Thank you. All right, we will move on to item 8.3 which was a discussion and possible action to approve the application for adaptive reuse of a property as a restaurant, brewery, tasting room at 32 Patton Street. And we have a request uh, to continue that item to a meeting of July 9th. So I guess I'd like to have somebody make a motion to uh, continue that item. May I ask a question of yes. Chair Felder? Yes. I, I would like to know uh, from planning staff, why it is that a building that used to be a firehouse that was converted into a business uh, and and tasting, I, I don't know if they have taste, they don't have tasting room there, basically a business use, which was it, at that point the adaptive reuse of a historical structure can continue to qualify as an adaptive reuse in perpetuity. The rea it seems to me the adaptive reuse provision has essentially been exercised. So I'm happy to answer that question. The project- yeah, Hang on, Christina. We, we need to be very careful. We, this is not an item for discussion. The, the item of discussion is for the continuance. Otherwise we're having a hearing without having a hearing. I'm a little bit concerned about that. Well, I'm basically asking a question about the adaptive reuse provision, whether it applies to this project or any other project in the city. I'm asking the question, can an adaptive reuse provision be used uh, more than once? Larry, Larry, I'm happy to send you some documentation, but uh, the application the when the property was sold back in 2013 it was very clearly stated that it was going to be a multi-phase project and this is part one of the second phase of that multi-phase project okay thank you i'd like to make a also i'd like to continue item 8.3 um the discussion possible action to 
approve applications for the adaptive reuse of the property for a restaurant, brewery, and tasting room located at 32 Patton Street, <laughs> July 9, 2020. I'll second that and I'm looking forward to it. Hey, if there's no further discussion, I'll have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Barbos. Yes. Commissioner Kelso Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Larry Barnett. Aye. Commissioner Bohar. Aye. Commissioner O'Neill. Yes. Commissioner Wellinger. Yes. Chair Felder. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Yeah, Thank Mr. You. Chair, and we certainly heard the comment, and we can provide in the staff report when it comes back uh, the answer to, to uh, Commissioner Barnett's question. Everybody, Thank you. Yeah. There are no items for discussion, so an issues update from uh, Mr. Storer. Yeah, Wendy's going to put up a, uh, an image, I think. <laughs> Can so, you see that, David? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we're good to go. Uh, can the commission see that too? I don't know how big the print is. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, we've been kind of busy uh, since the beginning, of, almost the beginning of the year. Certainly just got uh, out of the PSPSs and uh, here we are into COVID. Um, so since March, uh, myself and uh, Christina have been involved with some of the homeless issues either in Santa Rosa or elsewhere, and Wendy's been kind of holding down the fort. We're kind of getting back, sliding back into some of our regular business. Um, but I do want to bring you up to date on a couple of items that have been, or a few items, not a couple, that have been before the city council. And I'll explain a little diagram there in a minute. In the calendar. So uh, at the last council meeting, uh, excuse me, the one before that, um, we did have the, the city council did provide direction on a cannabis tax to be placed on the ballot. And if the commissioners are interested in having more uh, uh, additional conversations with me, I'm happy to call and talk to you about that, about the, the tax rate structures that we provided in that tax uh, initiative. Um, and that language has been approved by the council to go onto the ballot. Uh, we had just recently at the last city council meeting uh, completed phase, uh, excuse me, uh, phase one, steps one, two, and three, where the council basically selected uh, candidates or proposers to move forward to phase two, where they go ahead and uh, look for a site. They'll have 45 days in which to locate a site and also receive a zoning verification letter from our department. They selected Spark and Justice Grown. And those two particular proposers uh, are vying for the one retail storefront. Uh, no candidates or proposers uh, were interested that were remaining in uh, having a retail non-storefront cannabis business. Um, also, in a prior city council meeting recently, uh, language for the UGB was uh, given to the staff for us to post. We've since posted it on the internet with redline versions and the like. Um, that is out there for public comment right now. June 29th will be when the we go back to the city council to give its final blessing on the language that will then go on the November ballot. The council, as I think we mentioned earlier, talked about emergency generators, uh, section, I think it's 9.5 or 5 point something, I'm forget, forgetting now, so I apologize. Uh, but we are going back with the uh, some amend amendments to the municipal code to allow emergency generators to operate uh, above the sound level uh, decibels of by allowing them to exceed the standards that are in the code by five decibels across the board during a PSPS. Hopefully we never have to get to that, but um, that's something that we'll be doing at the council meeting on the 29th. Uh, before, uh, between now and July the 1st, we'll be um, submitting an application for $65,000 of non-competitive uh, funds, uh, grant funds for the local, uh, local early action planning funding, which is basically a mirror of the SB2 grant money that we received. You may recall we received $160,000 to towards planning efforts to increase the production of housing. And we selected the development code and the housing element and the general plan to be talked about in addition to some of the town halls, the ADU ordinance, the non-residential fees that we've adopted, all to help promote affordable housing in the city. So we should find out about that probably within the next month or two. Uh, uh, we basically have the application pretty much ready to submit. We'll be going to the council for authorization of a resolution to do 
the submittal to HCD on Monday night. Uh, for those of you that have been watching the Verizon cell tower uh, discussion that we uh, on Monday night, the June the 15th, and we have, uh, this is the, the appeal. You may recall that there are actually two repeal, appeals of, the, of your body's action one by the applicant Verizon on two conditions and another second appeal by Lynn Marie de Vincent and Mark Marthaler uh, with respect to allowing any uh, cell sites in the city uh, at all. Um, then the last thing, and that is the, an explanation of my little colored chart there. Um, we've been busy, as I said, um, and Wendy and Christina in particular with respect to uh, trying to work around the COVID reopening uh, recovery actions of uh, local businesses in and around the plaza. You've probably been to some of the restaurants where we've issued temporary use permit um, to try to uh, address the city council's direction where we want to try to help facilitate the reopening uh, as we come out of this particular phase of COVID. Uh, as a result of our work, uh, many of us have been working on weekends. You can see in the pink there, those are all of the city council meetings. It doesn't show the one just four days before June the 1st that we had on May 27th, which was the, the in-depth cannabis meeting where we presented our top five finalists to the city council. So there's one just around, around there. You can see that uh, we've got a planning commission tonight. We're the blue box. We had CSEC last night and we have DRHBC uh, a week uh, follow this next Monday. Just by way of comment, the, uh, the last DRHBC, I think we had 10 items on that agenda. So we've been kind of busy doing some more administrative stuff. Uh, we do hope to be dark in July. We haven't worked that out yet with the city manager. We, when I say dark, we're talking specifically about city council items. Uh, we're hoping to go dark with CSEC and DRHPC in July. Uh, however, for the planning commission, we do have uh, some projects that we want to try to help uh, get through our system. Um, that would be a, the three badge discussion that we just uh, continued and also uh, some more car through place items uh, that need to be uh, that are timely and we would like to get through. That being said, um, if there are meetings in July, um, other than that, we can um, talk about them a little bit later. Um, that concludes my update, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, comments from the commission? Well, we, we seem to be kind of going around in circles on this issue of the development code and uh, the update. We got this uh, color coded package um, with no explanation or anything uh, accompanying it. Um, no work plan associated with doing anything with it. And uh, I continue to remain concerned that if we don't start to address some of these planning uh, and development code issues, we're going to be up against a series of decisions uh, about which the language of the development code uh, has already been demonstrated to be inadequate and ambiguous. Uh, I give as an example, even though we're in June, you know, by the time we get to August, uh, the uh, places like Hop Monk and others are going to start thinking about temporary tents when starting to make their arrangements for the rainy season. And we don't have and haven't had an opportunity to discuss that or a number of other areas in the development code that we've identified as problematic. Uh, I understand that convening a full meeting of the Planning Commission for a discussion of these items uh, is is a challenge, particularly in the in the Zoom era, and that David, you've got a lot of things on your plate. But as an alternative, for example, we could have a special meeting in which we decide to break up the planning to commission into non Brown Act groups of twos and threes and then assign a series of sections or areas of the development code to each of these subgroups who could then meet at their convenience to come back to the full commission with recommendations about language or ideas that pertain to those particular subject areas 
and then the commission as a whole could take action on those. Um, but I don't know what the consultants are doing. I don't know if the city is going to continue to engage any consultants. I don't know if these housing issues are, are still a priority or whether the state has waived uh, any of these uh, changes in the code as it pertains to housing applications. I just feel absolutely at this point both a bit rudderless and, and dare I say it, a bit useless. And I, I'm struck by the situation of having a group of seven or eight people with some of whom have previous planning commission experience, uh, all of whom are highly intelligent and capable, sitting around twiddling their thumbs while the city's worried about money, but we're not being asked to do anything and we've all volunteered to help. And I just don't know what to think about it. It feels like a terrible waste of time to me. So if I can, Mr. Chair, um... I do want to assure you that you do have a professional staff that knows what it's doing. And the goal is to use the planning commission as a resource. We can write housing elements. We can write development codes without your input. We can bring it to you to act upon it. We choose to do that. The constraints that I have right now as your director is number one, staffing. Right now, Captain Bly has a problem. He's got a mutiny on his hands. We need staff to have vacations. I haven't had a vacation. I was going to England in March, but then this global thing happened, right? And so we've got people, in fact, Captain Bly may, may join the mutinies. I'm not sure. The point being is we have uh, limited resources as far as budget going. We have 160,000. I think we can get 80,000 of that back to replenish uh, our, our funding. We have a serious budget deficit. Um, I don't know what my staff resources are going to be. I'm going to choose local staff over consultant staff. So to answer the question about consultant staff, they're not working right now. Uh, we would like to have uh, some attention drawn to the efforts of the SB2 money, which is the dev code and the housing element. The gun that I have to my head is not the dev code. The gun that I have to my head is the housing element. I've got to find out for you guys how to figure out uh, where housing arena numbers are going to be going in the city because guess what i can't use the last two housing elements that we've had housing opportunity sites they're off the, they're off the, uh, the the plate they're off the, the map because you failed in two prior elements to develop those lands acd i think and those are a joke and we've got to come up with whatever number we come up with oh and by the way it's more likely going to be double the number so i've got a gun against my head i've got a clock against my head and I have to perform uh, by getting you all a new housing element. Now, whether we do that internally with staff or consultants, I don't know. That's why we're going after this new uh, 65 grand so that we can decide how to pay staff with that money or with the consultants. So clearly, we have the development code that is sorely in need. I'd recommend to you that we take that on first and get some of the low-lying fruit dev code issues done rather than doing a wholesale or comprehensive uh, change to the dev code. The, the important thing to remember is you are a resource to us, your advisory to staff and the council. Our goal is to use you. Maybe we convene a meeting in early August, uh, in addition to our regular August meeting, to talk about how we're going to break that apart. I'll have time to do that. We also have pressure on the south end of town with respect to a pre zoning and annexation request. There's some larger issues at hand there as well. We know that there's a pony and the Serafini property are uh, under the and in the control of the same folks as doing the Doyle property. There's a bigger plan that we have to address. So it is our intent to use you as a commissioner, as a commission, whether it's in parts or in whole, to do that. July is not the month to do it, Mr. Chair. Other comments from the commission? Seeing none, I think it's time for adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> second. I didn't see who the second was. Jim Bohar. Yes. Uh, all, right. uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
Seeing no one, no one in opposition, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.